This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Wonderful. Any other um, comments or edits? Seeing none, um, I'll, I'll make the motion. I move to approve the meeting minutes of our joint meeting um, of our three school committees on July 7th. A second. Moved by McDonald and seconded by Spitzer. Um, we will take a roll call vote. I will start with the Amherst School Committee. Um, Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. And McDonald, aye. Ms. Hall? All right. Is there a motion from the Pelham School Committee? I move that we accept the meeting minutes from the joint meeting of July 17th, 7th. Second. Great. Okay, I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. And Hall, aye. Great. I'll um, now entertain a motion from the Region School Committee. I move that the Regional Committee accept the minutes of July 7, 2020, a joint meeting between the three school committees. Lord second. Moved by Stancer, seconded by Lord. We'll move to a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Deming. Deming, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye, and like to welcome Stephen broadcasting indoors. <laughs> Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes unanimously, nine to zero. Now, um, next up, we move on to public comments. Um, and we have a lot. We have one video and a lot of uh, voice recordings. The video, um, to be clear, is a voice recording um, that was submitted as a video. So I will do my best to share. Um, the screen. Are you seeing a video, the video? It's extra tiny. Okay. Good evening. I'm Steve. Steve. So uh, it's it's the document, okay, the video document. The document, and then uh, reading. I'm Anderson, Anderson, currently, currently, currently a middle, middle school, school, school teacher, teacher, and I live in Conway. Conway. In regards to the reopening of schools in September amid, amid the current, current pandemic, pandemic I think, I think we can, we can all, all agree that, that no one knows, knows what will happen. happen. One, One reason, reason we don't know more is because, because we made the cautious and correct decision in the spring to close the schools once the potential risk to students, staff, and families became evident. Because, because we did not experiment with our community's health and lives in the spring, we still do not know what would have happened. When the decision to close was made in March, we were alarmed by the news that nationwide cases of COVID-19 were rising at a rate of hundreds per day. Today, as we sit with the decision about our school's plans for this fall, nationwide cases are rising at a rate over 100 times as fast. Yesterday, it was approximately 62,000 new cases. While we have learned ways to attempt to mitigate the risks, it is safe to say that the current situation is um, 
I'm, as, I'm being seeing uh, asks for folks to remember to mute themselves um, so that we don't have the echo. Thank you. Far worse, worse than, than what we faced, faced in, March, in March, and that, and that we, we still, still do not know what will happen. happen. One, One can, can make the, the accurate, accurate point that Massachusetts, Massachusetts is currently faring, faring much better than other states. states. However, However, I trust you have all heard the analogy of saying our state, state is doing better than other states. states is like saying I only swim in the part of the pool where no one is peeing. Come, Come this fall, thanks to the various campus, campus reopenings of our beloved local colleges, there will be residents of many other states joining our pool and perhaps peeing in it. As to how that will affect our community's health and well-being, we just do not know what will happen. As a teacher, I have a great appreciation for the scientific method of questioning, hypothesizing, experimenting, collecting data, and then drawing conclusions. However, I am concerned for my students and their families, my colleagues and their families, and myself and my family, that we are all being volunteered as subjects in a great experiment when we clearly do not know what will happen. My request to you is that we choose the safest path for all parties involved and plan, plan to only, only teach and learn, and learn remotely until, until the current, current pandemic situation and the associated risks have been significantly altered. I know there are concerns that the remote instruction this spring was problematic and inconsistent. I would like to state that what we did in the spring was not carefully planned remote instruction, but was crisis teaching in reaction to an unprecedented situation nobody saw coming or had prepared for. We can and will do it better. If we decide now to choose what is safest for all, we can use the time we have left in summer to work towards creating and developing best practices for remote instruction and properly training all involved parties on how to manage it. It will be the fair, sensible, and safe choice for not only our school community, but the greater community as well. Thank you for your time. I apologize for those echoes that um, several of you reported. Um, so now I will play the Google, the, the voice messages that we received on our public comment phone line. Um, and I'm gonna play them um, in the order that they were received, starting with the ones, uh, the oldest ones, because some of these came in before um, our July 14th original schedule meeting. Hi, my name is Jennifer Page. I'm an Amherst resident, parent of an art student, and a UMass employee. As a non-essential worker at UMass, I've been safely working from home for the past 17 weeks. If my department were to now call an in-person meeting of 15 people and require masks and assure us that we would have the space to stay six feet apart, I wouldn't go because I would consider it unsafe. And in fact, such a meeting would not even be called at this time because we all know that staying home and meeting virtually is the safest thing for all. And now we're considering sending our pre-K-12 students and educators into a situation every day that even office workers aren't being asked to do. Before you decide on opening up school buildings for in-person learning, I would ask that you consider holding a meeting of the Amherst, Pelham, and Regional School Committees in person in a school classroom while wearing a mask the whole time and sitting at desk six feet apart. Doing this for the length of one of your meetings will give you a sense for what we would be asking students and educators to do. And if you're unwilling or uncomfortable engaging in such an experiment, then I would ask that you not approve any plan that includes in-person learning. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jenny Oskarski. I'm a resident of Amherst. I am a parent educator at Amherst Regional Middle School, and I have been for the past three years. Um, I'm recording a comment to express my significant concern about returning to school um, in any capacity in September. I work in a special education classroom where it would be extraordinarily difficult for my students to wear masks for any length of time. It will also be difficult to maintain um, the six feet or even three feet of distance recommended by most social distancing guidelines. My concerns are both for myself and my own health as well as my my house my housemates at home um, as well as the well-being of my students both with levels of anxiety as well as physical health. I already have to work um, two jobs to afford 
my rent and groceries and student loans, and I would be concerned about returning to school in person in the fall and putting myself and my body um, at risk in, in such a way. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Jeff Friedman, a Northampton resident. I'm a 24-year veteran of the ARHS math department. I leave this message out of my love for our school, for our students, for this community, and for my colleagues. I'm deeply concerned that relying heavily on in-person teaching has the potential to jeopardize the health and well-being of our students and their families and our colleagues and their families. I worry that we are missing an opportunity to devote our time and energy to make distance learning the very best that we can. As teachers, we absolutely love working with our students. Many of us chose to teach in Amherst because of our district's core belief that every student matters, and our district's leadership and our colleagues' belief that the best learning happens when our classrooms are dynamic, stimulating, engaging, supportive, interactive environments where students are encouraged and expected to engage in dialogue and problem solving every day with their peers with the support and able guidance of their teachers. Our past experience has been, and common sense tells us, that this kind of learning happens best when students are able to work with us and with their peers in the same physical space. However, the pandemic has completely changed what is possible for us to do safely in schools. I believe that we need to focus on distance learning because of the enormous health risks, physical and mental, associated with trying to have people gather safely in schools, staggering logistical challenges for transportation and instructional space design, and the matter of adolescence hardwired nature, which is to exhibit risky behavior, to want to congregate and be physical with and physically close to each other and to have difficulty following rules. Here's what I think we should be doing to prepare for the school year. One, develop distance learning based models that are sustainable for teachers and staff and have the greatest potential for success for all students. Two, develop robust tutoring and support services, both remote and in person, that will support the whole child and that are provided by teachers, staff, and where appropriate, by students' peers. Distance learning could be the focus for 80% of students' time devoted to school, with specific in-person exceptions for students in specialized programs. For the remaining 20% of their time devoted to school, students could access extra help with their learning and could access support for the whole child, including programs and services that address community building, students' emotional well-being, executive functioning, and navigating relationships. The tutoring and whole child services could be done remotely and in person at tutoring and support centers that are school building based and community based. The tutoring and support centers could be housed at the high school, the middle school and community based centers and in the elementary schools by distributing the in person services across the towns we serve in all the school buildings and community based centers. We would promote access for all students and reduce reduce the need for transportation. Thank you for your time. Bye bye. Jennifer Jensen, Conway, Massachusetts, teacher at arms. To the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee and Superintendent Morris, as skilled compassionate educators in Amherst, we would like to question the safety and wisdom of the current draft plan to return to any in-person learning in the fall. To illustrate this, we ask what does a safe, creative, student-centered dynamic learning classroom look like? Students learning through hands-on science experiments and groups. Students working collaboratively on a project at a table. Students sitting together, problem solving, and using math manipulatives. Students acting, singing, playing instruments, dancing, and playing sports together. Students having freedom of movement, moving through learning stations, stretching, and using the bathroom. Students seeing friends and mixing with peers throughout the day. Students using paper, pencil markers, as well as computers. Teachers moving around the room to sit with students for one-to-one -one help. It's important to understand that what is described above will not happen in a socially distanced in-person classroom. What in-person learning classrooms will look like. Six feet of separation between all people. Teachers at the front of the room. Students at separate desks. Everyone wearing masks. No close physical proximity in-person group work or teacher help. No sharing of materials. The majority of work will be done on student Chromebooks. Significantly limited movement and mixing throughout the day. Teachers are responsible for monitoring student health and safety, including symptoms, distance, and mask requirements. Likely increased anxiety over safety for students and staff. Possible increased disciplinary actions resulting from students unable to sustain required physical distance and mask use that is needed for in-person learning. We wonder what meaningful learning can happen in person this way with these restrictions. 
Teachers are eager to explore the benefits and possibilities of redesigning courses with a robust, dynamic, remote learning focus. We can read or listen to a short story, analyze and discuss it together online, and thoughtfully write about it while remote learning. We can have students conduct an experiment at home. They can use their Chromebooks to photograph what they did, and online discuss with others their hypotheses, materials, procedures, data, data analyses, and conclusions. Students can take measurements of objects at home, then compare with classmates online to derive and prove the Pythagorean theorem. Using multimedia clips, digital storytelling, and interactive timelines, students can unpack the effects of landmark Supreme Court decisions. Well-planned remote learning for all starting in September will provide a stable and consistent experience for students and teachers. If the world becomes a much safer place, it's going to be very easy for teachers to transition from remote learning back to our familiar in-person learning. It's incredibly difficult to do the opposite. Let us focus our time and work now to prepare welcoming, thoughtful, and differentiated remote learning this fall for the best possible learning outcomes for all of our students. Sincerely, 39 teachers from Amherst. So I apologize um, that I played the incorrect message um, that it, um, she re-recorded that with the um, with the, the 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 moniker 39 educators from um, the middle school and the high school. I will also note that for those when we get to the reading the document. Um, the document is posted on our website. So in case it is difficult to read when we're streaming the, the actual document. Um, folks can go over to the arps.org website and locate the public comment document there on the agendas page. Um, and the full content, the full text and the detail, all the names of the educators that signed that letter, the 39 educators, is included at the end of that document. Good afternoon. This is Rob Kostner, uh, resident of Amherst, a former Selectman in Amherst and a uh, recent uh, candidate for at large uh, town council in Amherst. Uh, I'm calling with regard to uh, plans to reopen the uh, Amherst public schools, both the regional and the elementary schools, um, in any way other than uh, remote learning. Uh, as many of you may be aware, um, in addition to the modes of transmission that people have been familiar with, uh, air droplets transmitted directly from people to other people, or deposition on surfaces, which then might be picked up by other people. It's recently become clear that aerosol transmission is also expected means of transmission. Okay, so the people can simply be in a room with someone else, even if they're masked up, even if they're practicing two meter social distancing and lack of adequate ventilation means that the viral load of the room becomes significant enough that an infection can occur. I think given the state of the school buildings that uh, most of the different classes would be taking place in, it is not wise to reopen the schools for the kids or especially for the teachers, many of whom are at higher risk uh, than, uh, than the kids, many are over, over 60, uh, without having the community rate of transmission, the community rate of infection of COVID-19 much lower than it is now. It might take it, you know, even Hampshire County is doing quite well, but it might take um, a reduction by a factor of 10 to have uh, an acceptable rate given the aerosol transmission possibility. I mean, there are many, many other reasons why uh, having kids continue to learn at home are probably a better option for the, at least for the fall until uh, Amherst and Hampshire County and Massachusetts and the rest of the United States get their transmission rates down to an acceptable level. Um, let's just add that the letter 
Hi, my name is Alicia Walker. I am an Amherst resident and a parent of three young black children in the Amherst school system. I am a graduate of Amherst Regional High School, a UMass Amherst alum, and I currently work in the criminal justice system advocating for anti-racist policies. I am urging and advocating for Amherst to consider the implementation of anti-racist policies within the school district as a priority when it comes to planning for fall of 2020, including but not limited to COVID relief and recovery. I want to address the inadequacy of the data collection that was completed by the district. Not only did the survey not address many of the main concerns of black and brown families at this time, but I question whether or not it even reached them at all. Uh, it is important to acknowledge the access barriers these families may face, um, which in turn skews public survey data in the direction of the population to which it reached. This data is missing the input of entire groups, which our community. This data is missing the input of entire groups, which are um, the groups that this, that the broken system already affects within our community. Some of the barriers include, but are not limited to, access to technology, the understanding and use of technology time commitments, and language barriers. People who fall into these groups are already bearing the burden of our broken educa education system, and our work must be centered around them. I also want to take this time to debunk the superintendent's claims that there were multiple forms of outreach to families, as the only correspondence I received via email was via email, and the only platform I was presented with to express my experiences was this survey. I am a young black single working parent, my eldest child has a high service IEP. Um, I expressed difficulties at many times during distance learning to staff. Um, and although Wildwood was amazing, I feel although this was lost in translation and I didn't receive any additional outreach. I also wanted to take a minute to speak on the superintendent's comments regarding the Crocker Farm staff member who was making racist posts on Facebook. It was stated that the district would look at its social media policy, and I want to point out that this is a dangerous method that will not protect our students. Banning someone from posting on social media will not change their character or beliefs, and their beliefs will still display themselves in the classroom in other ways. A more effective method would be to implement anti-racist hiring policies, um, and so I am also advocating for that today. Thank you. Hello, my name is Carol Cherrington. I live in Pelham. I have worked at Amherst Regional High School for 10 years. Our two children were educated through the Amherst Pelham Regional School. My question concerns the district's legal preparation as an in loco parentis entity. As such, the district promises to protect all children, as would a loving parent. In its beginning of the year registration packets, will the district include a waiver of liability fully holding the district blameless and harmless in the event that a child or family member becomes sick or dies due to COVID-19? In light of the immense liability facing the district, I urge the school committee to extend remote learning for all schools and all families through December 31st, 2020. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Carol Gray and I'm a parent, um, a 10th grader, and I'd like to make a public comment about opening up in the fall. First of all, thank you very much for your work. I know these are very challenging times. I'd encourage you to consider doing online initially and not reopening in person. Uh, the reason I'd say this is because uh, the town manager's recent letter to the chancellor starts off saying, I have, I quote, I have profound concerns about two major decisions made recently by the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. The first major decision was to open your dormitories to thousands of additional students who otherwise may not be traveling to Amherst to live for the fall semester. The second was to treat university students 
living on campus and off campus differently in your academic pandemic management plans. I believe these two decisions will endanger the health and perhaps lives of those who live in and around the town of Amherst. Uh, he continued to say time is short. Students are invited to return within five weeks. And this was a letter on July 10th. He also says, I fear that the decision to bring additional students to town will fuel the conditions for a massive spread of COVID-19 that could overwhelm our local public health infrastructure, create a crisis for our local hospital, strain the capacity of our EMS first responders, and force our public safety officers into difficult, untenable, and possibly dangerous situations. Numerous schools are starting off remote. Um, uh, Arlington, Virginia just announced three days ago they were going to 100% remote. San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, San Diego, uh, numerous, Atlanta, numerous schools are saying they're at least going to start online. I think we should start online and see how it goes with UMass. Uh, UMass already had cases, um, even over the summer, uh, confirmed cases. Uh, April 5th, an employee at the Blue Wall Cafe. April 21st, an employee at the Integrated Sciences Building. April, May 1st, an employee at UMass Police Department tested positive. Uh, at the Berkshire Dining Hall Commons, June 1st, someone tested positive. Two students in July have tested positive. What when tens of thousands of students return? We really don't want to have our kids back in the schools right now, I don't think. Um, OSHA requirements for employees say that a workplace must be free of hazards that could cause serious injury or death. In Arizona, three teachers who shared a classroom to teach their online courses all wore masks, all socially distanced and disinfected twice daily. All three got COVID-19 and one died. We don't want to find out the hard way with a teacher dying that we shouldn't have reopened. There's a safe way to do this. And the safest thing to do is to wait and do remote initially. I'd also urge. That is all of the recorded uh, message. And now we'll move on to the uh, written comment that was emailed to, um, to us with subject public comment. Um, more public comment has continued to come in. And as um, any public comment that came in after 3 p.m. today will be shared in, um, in our public comment period at tomorrow evening's meeting. So can folks see that? I, I can't see what you are seeing for some reason. So, <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I will also- A little uh, larger would be nice, but if you can't make it larger, I can live with it. Did that make it larger? Yes. Let's see, how's that? Did that go off screen? Yes. <laughs> okay, I'll go back down. Um, and as a reminder for um, folks that are watching um, from home, um, we have posted this um, document on the website. So if it is not coming through clearly on your screen at home, um, feel free to navigate over to arps.org, find the regional school committee agendas page, and you will be able to find this document there.
for folks keeping track at home, I am tracking, um, doing my best to track the three minute timer as well for each comment.
this final message is uh, the written of the recorded message. So I'm going to scroll very quickly through this just to the list of teacher names. And again, as a reminder to everybody, um, this document is available on the arps.org website. If you go to regional school committee and the agendas, you will find the document there. As a reminder to everybody watching, we are um, we always expect accept sorry <laughs> public comment um, on our uh, public comment phone line, and the number is posted at the top of every one of our agendas. Um, so folks that want to have their comments read aloud so that viewers can hear the comments, um, that is the best option, um, or submit by email to uh, McDonald A at arps.org with the subject line public comment. And I ask with the volume of public comment that we are receiving by, by email, I ask your um, cooperation in putting that co public comments in the subject line so that I can be sure to get that into the public comment in time for the meeting. Otherwise, I follow up with you to ask if it is comment or just for the school committee. Um, so we are continuing to accept public comment for tomorrow evening as well. Um, and with that, it will pull up our agenda so we can move on. Um, and welcome, Dr. Morris. Uh, <laughs> um, so we are uh, unbelievably running four minutes ahead. So we are now moving on to the superintendent's update. Sure. A um, couple things to share. Um, so thank you. I apologize. I got most of the public comment, uh, and I'll watch the video for the others. Um, I was on a MASCD, which is Massachusetts Association of Supervision Curriculum Development Panel. Which and thanks, Miss Lord, who uh, uh, I guess couldn't get enough of virtual meetings tonight, and ended up joining that one, which started at 4:30. So it was nice to have you on that call, Miss Lord. Uh, but I apologize for being late. It was a prior commitment. Um, so a couple DESI updates. Uh, I think we are anticipating the transportation guidance from them, hopefully next week. On Friday, we did receive the stop and start protocols. It's a 17 page document. Um, all these documents we receive are going on the fall 2020 website, which is linkable from our, our homepage uh, about you know if there's um, someone who's suspected of having COVID in the school, uh, either student or staff or someone who's confirmed, the steps you have to take. It, there's, it's a long document, but there's a really helpful chart I found uh, that is about halfway through to help guide decision making on those matters. Um, we're also anticipating next week getting uh, receiving guidance about music, physical education, and athletics. Um, we uh, we also received uh, information which you're aware of that three plan or one document with three plans a all in person a hybrid model and an all remote plan are due to Desi on, by the 31st of this month and a final plan by August 10th and they uh, asked us not to make a final decision until early August because at that point we'll have a better sense of the health information as well as the financial situation right now the state has given us. A budget for the summer, as you know, but not beyond the summer. There is no FY21 state budget. There's a month-to-month -month budget. And so uh, they um, gave us um, that guidance. And um, a couple other things. Contractors uh, started work on Fort River. They're making great progress. Our own facilities group is making great progress on Wildwood. I get an update on that this afternoon from Mr. Roy Clark. So in terms of some of the major modifications that we're, we're looking to make those buildings, those are going well. Um, as you may know, there were different uh, harassment regulations passed this spring that relate to Title IX. Um, Dr. Marta Guevara is our Title IX uh, supervisor coordinator. And I wanna publicly thank the Collaborative for Educational Services who's organizing a training uh, by Jeannie Tate on the new Title IX regulations so that Dr. Guevara can learn that and bring it back both to the committee but also to the district. Uh, we have engaged child care providers over the last week. Uh, again, Dr. Guevara has been very helpful in this, uh, being that we are, it doesn't not look like we'll have before and after care programs about the potential of providing uh, child care, particularly for children of staff members who are in the buildings next year. Uh, we, much like bus companies last year, we have a vested interest in child care providers maintaining in business, uh, maintaining um, working with us. And so I'll have more on that soon, but I think it's just one of these ways that they're critical to our community. The current situation probably won't allow for um, 
continued use as it's typically been done in the past. And we're trying to figure out a way if there's a mutually beneficial solution to that challenge. Uh, Bright is our program at the middle school and high school um, that supports resiliency in youth. Um, they have a lot of expertise on mental health and they're going to be working with our administrative team in early August and they um, and continue on uh, to work more with staff around how to support students' mental health needs um, given uh, multiple things going on locally and nationally. So we're, we're appreciative to have them working with us. The group that's working on anti-racist curriculum I got a long one, so I don't know if you want, it's it's a rather lengthy update. Um, I don't know, I saw a hand go up, Ms. McDonald, so I don't know if you want me to go through it and take questions or pause. Um, I, why don't we pause if there was a question on, on the portion that uh, Dr. Morris just said, Mr. Menino. Uh, you mentioned a DESI guides on start-stop. Does that mean uh, what criteria will be used to shut down the schools? I further, re I can't remember back in March, did you close down the schools or was it a government, uh, uh, the governor's call? So in March, uh, that was ended up being a decision that I made. Uh, this is more guidance of, um, this is guidance for if students are in school and there's a suspected case of COVID. So this isn't, let me differentiate. So I think what you're asking about is something I'm hungry for. I'll address in a, in a minute or two. Actually, it may be tomorrow night that I address that. Maybe I'll mention it here. Is more specific uh, public health guidance opening about infection rate, that kind of thing. This is much more in the moment you do. A kid comes down with a fever. How do you handle that situation in the school setting? My concern is we're being asked to uh, vote on a program for reentry without knowing what the exit strategy is. And I have a problem with that. Yep. And I think I can speak to that a bit more tomorrow night when it's more formally on the agenda for me to respond to, if that's okay, Mr. Munoz. Thank you. Um, so the group working on anti-racist curriculum is making great progress. I got to check in and hear the group working for a bit um, last week and um, got to see some of where they are uh, looking at developmental levels of students and a scope and sequence. So I want to thank the team working on that. It's it's hard work, but it is the work. So. Uh, thank you. We have 100. We had 123 staff members attend the Dismantling White Supremacy workshops that occurred over the lot in June and July. Uh, obviously, um, at this point via Zoom, that'd be a lot of people to be in one place. Um, but the feedback from staff has been phenomenal in terms of the impact um, and galvanizing work instead of just, oh, that was really interesting and uh, much more what are the next steps, which is what we want people to say when they go to a workshop. Um, we are now uh, actively investigating health check products for students, families, and staff. So the guidance from Massachusetts is to have a system by which uh, there's a verification uh, around symptoms um, before students come to school. Uh, Jill, our, our nurse manager who you've met, uh, is working on that. She found a product she likes, and we'll probably have more on that, not by tomorrow, but by probably a week from now. Uh, to be able to share, but it's basically an easy tool where staff members and families can verify certain things about the health, any symptoms, and it actually has a, a useful health tracker that would assist in contract tracing and look for trends across the schools. It's actually a useful thing we'd have in general, you know, because we often, frankly, kids are out and we can we can see those trend lines, but we, it doesn't collect symptoms. And so uh, I was excited looking at it today after Ms. Consolino sent it to me. Uh, just a quick note on annual preventative maintenance. I know I've mentioned this before, but I think I can't say it enough. So in terms of exhaust fannings, uh, we're working on changing belts, lubricate, identify and replacing failed motors, motors uh, and supply fans and direct drive clean, lubricate and change filters. Again, most of the filters we're changing. We're going to wait till August because we want to change them as close to students returning as we can. But the exhaust fans and the fans, the belts we're working on now. We're also assessing build them automated, auto, building automation system for maximizing the outdoor air. I talked about that, I think, a little while ago. Essentially, that's when can we start and stop uh, the univents and the air blowers to turn over the air as much as possible. Um, and so we're working on that. Also, uh, just this afternoon, we purchased uh, ultraviolet light HEPA air um, room air purifiers from Capital Cost. And so these have both the ultraviolet light, which um, more and more is being more recommended more and more uh, as uh, working well with COVID as well as other illnesses uh, around disinfection on a regular basis. Also having the HEPA filters will improve air quality regardless of the situation with COVID. Uh, Mr. Roy Clark was and his team were able to find a product that, that effectively did both and had good reviews. 
Uh, so we're making that purchase. Uh, to Mr. Minero's point, I'll just speak to it briefly because it's actually second to last item on my update, uh, which is I know New York State, I shared this with the committee, came out with their, uh, their guidance for return and they actually do have explicit public health markers to guide uh, entrance and exit in terms of that. Um, and they, the public health markers start on August 1st because a lot of them are 14 or seven day averages, which I thought was really smart to have not wait till the school year starts, but if we're talking about averages, you need to start well ahead of time and get superintendents used to be able to look for things and they're regional, they're not across the entire state of New York. Uh, so I'm not here to weigh whether they're the right numbers, the wrong numbers. I just am hoping Massachusetts comes up with something similar that's an objective public uh, way to assess uh, how things, how community spread is working. Finally, you know, I've, I've received a number of questions about distance learning for next year. Um, I want to briefly address those. I'll go into more detail tomorrow. But one is that I've uh, all indications from the commissioner that the time on learning requirements, uh, which are 900 hours at elementary and 990 at secondary, will not change even if students are either opting in or we end up on a distance learning uh, module because of uh, the nature of the public health needs. And so, you know, I know there's a lot of concerns and we saw that when uh, Obed, uh, mostly Obed, but a little bit me, presented the, the distance learning survey. And so I think for families and for staff, people can expect that all the standards are gonna be expected to be covered. You know, we're gonna be acknowledged that uh, we didn't cover all the ones last spring, so it may have to adjust what standards are covered, but it's not going to be, uh, last year we were allowed to have a resource delivery model, which is essentially we offered, staff offered resources for families to work themselves and that, uh, we have clear indication will not be in play this year that it's a direct instruction model that may be synchronous or asynchronous uh, and that the time on learning requirements will be met. So uh, all that to say distance learning next year will be a very different um, structure, have very different structures than distance learning did this spring. I'll get into more details tomorrow night, especially when we start looking at schedules because many of the schedules are actually can be utilized interchangeably between whether it's in distance or in person, um, there'll be some differences of um, how how those processes are implicated, impl implemented, but it wouldn't be the case uh, as it was this year where we'd have uh, the release from the time on learning requirements and expectation that only about three hours of work happened, which you know the survey indicated we, we got that right. Uh, that won't be the case in the fall. Um, and I know I'll talk more about it last night, but there's a, a number of emails and phone calls I've received on that topic, so I wanted to clarify that uh, it's not necessarily comparable what happened last spring to what would uh, what we're planning and what would need to happen uh, in the fall for anyone who's on distance learning for any reason. So that that was a long-winded one. I apologize, but you know, two weeks before meetings gets me out of my flow, I suppose. <laughs> um, I can I follow up on the the comments, um, your update about the the ventilation and the the univents and and outdoor air. Can you sort of Describe that. What describe that again, and sort of also include sort of what's been happening before then, and what changes are 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 um, underway. Sure. So um, so typically, uh, and I'll speak to all schools. There's some unique variables at Fort River and Wildwood we've spoken to before, and I'm spoken about before, and I'm happy to speak to them again if that if that's helpful. But in general, we try to you know we use the ASHRAE standards. We try to balance um, how how often the room turns over in terms of air. Uh, with energy efficiency. And so in this one, you know, we're gonna tip the balance to having air vent univentilators blowing more often. In other words, starting before longer before students arrive and longer after students and staff depart so that the room air can turn over more often. Additionally, the other things around ventilation is having fewer students in rooms and more space and fewer things has a huge impact on ventilation and airflow. So if you think of Fort River and Wilder in particular, where the unit ventilators historically were butting up against partial walls halfway on their journey uh, and having one point out, uh, that wasn't promoting airflow that was helpful. Uh, in this way, uh, with fewer things, humans, uh, carbon dioxide coming from human beings, as well as objects in the room, it allows for better airflow, but really running them longer before and longer after, you know, and, and just another thing just to put it, make it a little more concrete. So at the elementary level, we typically have students come at 7.30 in the morning, uh, if not sooner for before care, and we have students who stay till 5.30. And so without those two, if you look at the elementary schedules to look at tomorrow, it's about four and a half hours or about at least four hours more for both cleaning for our custodial crew, uh, but also for not having um, 
people in buildings to allow for disinfection uh, and allow for airflow. And that was some of our thinking talking to our local public health authorities is that the shorter day really does promote that and allow for air turnover at a much better rate. Um, in terms of the air, the air purifiers, the UV light is thought to disinfect things that are in the air. That's only becoming more important the more we're learning about the virus. And the HEPA filter also contributes to that as, as well as other pollutants uh, in the air. Our systems won't allow for a general HEPA system. So that's why we're buying individual air purifiers, uh, over 200 for every room that we would have students in in the district. Great, thank you. Mr. Demling? Yeah, I wasn't gonna bring this up, but since you're on the topic, um, Fort River and Wildwood, um, and I, I only bring this up because I've been asked it a couple of times. Um, for those of our community members who are following both the MSBA process for, for Fort River and Wildwood, the Amherst School Committee level, as well as this fall planning, natural question arises that, oh, we, we suddenly did these partitions for Fort River and Wildwood to create walls and buildings and we're increasing the airflow. Aren't those problems solved now? I heard those weren't solvable problems. Can you just briefly encapsulate why, why this doesn't solve the problems for those buildings and, and why they still need to be in the MSBA process? Sure. So uh, the first and most logistically, uh, most logistical reason is we're losing a tremendous number of classrooms. This only works because we're doing, we don't need some of those smaller spaces because we're not having students travel in the room to ESL and, and much to special education rooms. We're doing all of that in the rooms. Uh, but that wouldn't be our normal model. So we're going from, you know, having six quads. Typically, that meant that there were 24 spaces in those schools in those quads, and we're cutting that in half. Therefore, we're using the art room, the music room, the cafeterias as as classroom spaces, which is dislocating all the staff members who would typically be in there. So if this was not a COVID time, we would not be allowing, you know, classrooms and and having art teachers and music teachers not be in their spaces. Um, it, it really changes that. I think at a larger level, many of the problems, if not most of the problems of Fort River and Wildwood still remain. Um, so certainly we can put up those uh, walls in the middle. Again, then we have 1900 square foot rooms, which in a normal context would be a horribly inefficient use of space. In a COVID context, it actually works out to be okay, given our context, you know, again, right now. Um, it doesn't solve Fort River's roof problem. It doesn't solve uh, how many rugs we're ripping up. We're doing two quads in the ELL room at Wildwood, but we still have all of those types of issues that we need to solve. And so on a temporary, uh, very unusual basis, it allows for us using these buildings functionally because they are oversized for their current population. But the existing challenges of those buildings don't go away uh, with putting a, a half wall up uh, or a wall up that cuts it in half um, unless we were really going to shrink the population of students more dramatically in the future. Uh, again, this in, in this context where we don't want student movement, it, it, it's okay. Uh, that's not our normal context and, it, and uh, hopefully knock on wood at some point in the future when we are promoting student movement, which is what we want within the building, we would not have space for students and staff to do their what we'd want them to do in, in instructionally in, in any sort of way. So sorry, a little long winded, but uh, and I could keep going, but I think I'll, I'll hold it there. Ms. Spitzer. Um, thanks. I, I'm happy to hear that we're purchasing air filters. I'm assuming that, are we using CARES money for that? It sounds like a pretty big capital expense. I'm just curious about how we're going to cover that. Yep, we are using CARES money. The thing to note is that uh, the HEPA filters will be a good thing long after, um, again, knock on wood, we're, we're not in this current uh, place we're in. But the upkeep and the filters for HEPA filters will need to be a capital expense moving forward if we continue to use them. And so while this is covered by CARES money, this is something that uh, when we get to next year, and we're talking about capital expenses, we will need to ca add a capital expense to replace the filters. You know, we're buying enough for, I think, a year and a half in terms of filters, um, because I think that's what, what, what seems reasonable at the moment. Uh, but there will be, you know, a five digit add to our capital budget across the, at, you know, combined across the three districts. Uh, if we want to maintain HEPA filters, what I would suggest, I would be recommending that we do. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Sullivan. I think you need to unmute yourself. I have a few childcare questions, but I'll save them for tomorrow. Okay. I didn't hear that. I'm sorry, Steve. I didn't hear you. 
I have some questions about the child care, but I'll save them for tomorrow. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you for that. Okay. Okay. Any any more questions, comments from the committees? If I could just add, I want to, to Ms. Spitzer's, I should have said uh, and deservedly should have uh, thanked the town of Amherst and uh, for supporting some purchases uh, around some pretty big capital items through um, the, the municipal COVID funds that uh, they received, which has really helped us uh, be able to do that uh, across two of the three districts and, and using some of our COVID funds in, in the third. So, uh, but I, I really, not every community, there are some communities like ours there that the municipal is, government has made it a priority to support the schools during with CARES Act funds. And some of my colleagues did not have that um, real benefit. So I really want to thank the town for supporting schools. And they're certainly putting uh, their money where their mouth is in terms of continued support of our operation. Mr. Demling, did you have another comment or question? No. Great. Um, so we'll move on to um, chair's update. Um, I don't have an update, um, but I'm hearing from other committee members as well as I'm seeing email come in that there were um, some public comments that people um, have sent in um, and we did not get included this evening. So I apologize profusely for that. Um, and I will uh, double check my email, but if you have it ready and can just resend it um, with the subject line public comment, we will get those in for tomorrow evening's um, public comment, which right now is significantly shorter. So um, you will have more undivided attention <laughs> at that um, at that meeting. But please, again, I apologize. Um, best practice is to ensure you write public comment either in the subject line or the first line of the body of the email to be sure that we know that it is intended for public comment. We're getting a high, high volume of email and so it's really hard to track down each one about um, everybody's individuals and in intentions for those. Um, any announcements from any school committee members? Ms. Lord. Yes, the Zoom meeting that Dr. Morris mentioned before was titled Supporting Leaders Work Towards Racial Equity in Schools and District. I wanted to thank Dr. Morris for serving on this panel and having these conversations with other leaders from around the state. When I saw the topic, I couldn't resist and I left it in a feeling inspired and grateful. And to that end, racial equity, I'd like to announce that there will be a school equity task force meeting on July 29th at 6.30 p.m. Thank you. Mr. Demling. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly add to, you know, what you said about the high volume of, of public uh, email that we're getting on this topic. And just, just as a general comment to the public to, to, to thank you, just thanking the public for, for the input. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm not able to reply as, as thoughtfully and, and at length as, as the input that we're getting. Um, but but it it does have an impact. I mean, I'm I'm sure many, if not all, committee members feel this way that when you read something that is, uh, you know, so thoughtful and well informed and 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 is obviously speaking for the common good, uh, it it has a a definite impact on on our thinking and and, and what we're doing here. And so, um, I get I just I just didn't want people to think that if you didn't get a an actual reply, um, that it wasn't being considered because that's certainly not the case. I, th I think if we replied at the same length that we're getting, uh, we would just be doing email replies all day long. Um, but it's, it's, it's really been great. And so, you know, if you've been doing that, please continue to do that and encourage others to do so. Agree. Any other announcements? No, seeing none. And we'll now move on to new and continuing business. Um, and we do have um, a request that we swap the order of the uh, um, these uh, agenda items under new and continuing business, and that we address the resolution um, or motion on the town manager's letter um, first, and then move into our priorities um, uh, document discussion. Um, so I'm going to look to the committee to find out if, uh, if, if folks are okay with that proposed change. I'm sitting nodding heads and thumbs up. So um, we will move forward with that change. Um, and that uh, both the letter and the proposed motion are in our packets. 
Um, and since Mr. Demling, you were the lead on this, uh, would you like to introduce the topic? Sure. Um, I mean, I don't. I, I'm. I feel more like that. I'm, I'm echoing the town's effort on this, you know, rather than the lead. So, um, so last uh, last week, I think it was, or a week ago, Friday, uh, the Amherst town manager uh, sent a letter to the UMass chancellor. Um, it's been referenced in public comments, it's been in the paper, in the news, and whatnot. Uh, and it's in our packet, so I won't read the whole thing. But um, you know, just just to frame it, it's uh, very significant concerns uh, the town manager had has with the uh, UMass plan for reopening. Um, and uh, there was there was also another update today. So UMass had a press conference uh, this afternoon and released a couple of documents, um, not directly responding um, to the town manager, but but uh, giving an update. Uh, it seemed to address some of the points, if, but not all. Uh, I haven't heard uh, a response from the town manager yet, so I, I can't comment on that. Um, but yeah, that's that's the framing of it. I also have my own personal opinion and comment on it. But that's that's the framing of of why it's why it's here. Mr. Menino, I read the posted comments by the chancellor, and I think he was responding to the uh, town manager's letter. But that's just my opinion. Is there any uh, discussion? Mr. Demling? Uh, I'm, and Ms. Kenny. I'm happy to let Ms. Uh, Ms. Kenny go first. OK. Uh, so I think I have uh, two questions that I wrote when I read it the first time last week. So if, and I quickly, scanned the uh, response that they came out with today. So if this is in there somewhere and I missed, I apologize. Um, so one thing I took note of was a UMass agreement. Was that posted somewhere else and I just missed it? And then my other question was if we were asking, the town is asking UMass to test all of the students, but we're not testing the our own students. Um, is that fair? Or I, I just, you know, thought we should pay attention to those things. So I guess those are my two questions. Yeah, uh, Mr. Menino. My reading of the letter is that both students living on campus and off campus will have to sign the UMass agreement, if that's what you're referring to. Uh, Mr. Demling? And then Ms. Yeah, so, so the UMass agreement is posted. If you, if you, I don't know what the URL is exactly. If you Google, uh, UMass Amherst return to fall website. They have a website that um, in includes a link to the to the UMass agreement, and it's this it's this bulleted list of things that um, students commit to do. From what I understand, oh, there it is. And it's yellow sharing it in the summer. Um, from from what I understand from the um, response today from UMass, and again, it's I haven't had time to look at all of the details and requests of the letter and match it up with all of the details and response. Um, from from UMass today, um, but one thing they did say in their uh, response today is that all students on campus and off, um, if you're on campus, you'll be required uh, will be required to to uh, sign the UMass agreement if if they're here in Amherst. Um, what they they did not include, unless I missed this, is is what the consequences are for violating it, and, and what so what are the major sections in the town of uh, Amherst town manager's letter? I think it's section two. Uh, talks about enforcement uh, that there needs to be really clear consequences laid out by the university that needs to be explicit, um, and I did not I did not see that that there. Um, there's other detail uh, of of the other requests, but that's that's what I saw for the UMass agreement. Ms. Kenny, did you have another comment? Uh, no, no, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks. Ms. Spitzer, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I, I just wanted to um, say that I, I strongly support us voting to um, sign on to this letter. And, you know, I'm very happy to see that some of the items in this letter are being addressed. For example, I, I read today that there will be testing of um, students both on campus and off campus when they return to the Amherst area. So I, th I think some of 
at first I was like, well, maybe this is a moot point, but I, I think the, the, for the reasons Peter brought up that we should continue to um, consider signing on in support of it. And um, I appreciate um, the towns and um, specifically the town manager Bockelman's um, issuing this letter. And I think, I think we've seen some real change. So thank you. Mr. Demling. Yeah, so I mean, I, I support it as well. So why I brought it to the committee. Um, and I, I guess, you know, for the public as well, I just wanted to briefly connect the dots why we would focus on this here at the school committee level. And you know, the reason why I feel it's so critical is that um, I think, you know, more more than the COVID status at the country level or at the state level, it's it's the local Amherst conditions that are going to affect us. And in, in my view, nothing's going to affect our local conditions, which right now are relatively speaking quite favorable. Uh, nothing's going to affect that more than the arriving student population and, and their behavior. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I would also echo the sentiment that the town manager had in his letter, which is this is not anti-student. You know, I, I, I firmly believe we would not have the excellent quality public schools that we have today if it wasn't for the town support that we have. And the town wouldn't be able to give that support if it wasn't for the economy of the colleges and the university. You know, the fact that we have education as our industry is, is a, a beautiful thing culturally and economically. And, and the vast majority of students that I meet are friendly, kind, wonderful people that I'm very grateful to have here. But you know, we've all seen in the news with these super spreader events, it only takes a handful of uh, your really irresponsible behavior to risk the, the health of, of thousands. And so, um, you know, I was I was um, encouraged, but but only to a point by UMass's response today. Again, I haven't done the full detailed analysis, but um, the lack of consequences is is a pretty big standout to me. You compare this to places like Tulane that has said if they see fifteen students, more than fifteen students, not social distancing, they're going to get suspended or expelled. You know, and 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 that and that's it. And I feel like. If you're asking thousands of 18 and 22 year olds to sign something and you're not putting teeth behind it, an explicit statement of what's going to happen if you violate, um, you shouldn't expect the highest possible level of compliance. And I, I think that's what we need um, in order to, um, you know, in order, in order for the community to be healthy, you know, for, for our schools to, to reopen. And, you know, the other thing that I, I wasn't super enthused about in the UMass's response is they talked about um sort of these overtures of of working closely with the town um and that's great if it comes true but um you know to my ears it rings pretty hollow after the completely shutting out the town when designing the plan i mean that was in my view just a huge mistake on the part of the chancellor and umass community relations and there's no acknowledgement of that in their statements at all um so to expect that they're going to suddenly engage over the next three and a half weeks before students arrive at the level we need them to, you know, I'm not super, um, I'm, I'm not super uh, trusting that that's going to happen. I hope it does. I hope that this, that they, their actions will back up their words. But um, you know, I, th I think because of that, that you know, the, the, this motion, this the, the letter, and uh, the town of Amherst uh, town manager's uh, effort is is still relevant. So I think it's something we we could support. Ms. Hall. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say that I support it as well. I think it's just signing on to this uh, resolution is just really consistent with the deliberate and thoughtful and somewhat cautious approach that we're taking in all areas. And so I support it as well. And I'll also add on, oh, sorry, Ms. Seeger, I'll, I'll come to you, um, uh, that I also support it. And I think for me, the the most important piece is, is what Mr. Demling um, is, just said um, and is stated in the last sentence or the last line of our draft motion, which is this this idea of collaborating between the university and the town um, to develop a plan that works um, because we all are we are all part of the same community. Um, UMass does not operate in a vacuum, um, and the the two are, you know our two systems are very much dependent upon each other. Um, and when I look and listen to what other towns and universities have done in other parts of the country in terms of the tight, tight collaboration um, on how, how the universities are bringing students back or not, and seeing and comparing that to what we've experienced here in Amherst, I think that um, 
there's a lot more that we can be doing to be collaborating and work to, working together um, to a mutually beneficial um, arrangement. And so I wholeheartedly support this. Um, Ms. Seeger. I, I support this as well. Um, one of the thoughts I have, and I, I almost hesitate to bring it up because um, the university, UMass, is, is, I feel to a large degree, much more integrated with the town, having students living there. But we also have Amherst College in town as well. And it feels like kind of ignoring the fact that they're going to have 60% of their population on campus, too, is like, um, it, it's not a large population, but you know, it's um, something like seven to 900 students. and and within town and most are living on campus or in campus housing so i guess the relationship is different and we are you know by a factor of 10 there are way more umass students but i'm just wondering and this is more of a town question but is there any conversation happening with them you know i know focusing on umass is um being a large university is is a very good thing you know and we have this information about it but um it's just sort of nagging at the back of my mind that it's not the only college in town um, Dr. Morris, they, you know, there and present. Sorry, I, I apologize. Sure. So uh, this is not a political statement or, or advising the committee to do one thing or the other, but I have been briefed by Amherst College actually last week about their plans. Uh, all of their students will be living off campus. They're not allowing for students to live, I mean, on campus, excuse me. They're not allowing for their students to live off campus. I'm going to get an email from Biddy, but, um, but, um, and um, they're not allowed to leave campus. Um, so in terms of some of what I heard, I think from Mr. Demling about other colleges approaches, and I'm not saying Amherst College is good, UMass is bad, just as a comparative, right? It's a lot smaller. They cannot even receive um, deliveries, like food deliveries from places off campus. So they are really trying to wall off their campus as being a separate infrastructure. I know from my conversations with the town manager that weren't with Amherst College that they did have conversations about that um about the return and you know i will say my conversations with them they they highly see as does umass the relationship between the colleges and the schools and for their colleges to uh, they have a lot of employees who are parents in the district and so i i, I do want to note that i think there's um, a shared commitment on all on on all parts and same from hampshire college as well uh, i think that's not to suggest that the committee shouldn't vote against the resolution because i think the policies and practices are are not the same. Um, their testing protocols a little bit different and things like that. So, um, but but it, you know, I have been briefed on Amherst's college's plan. Um, you never know exactly how those things go. How do you have compliance if students leave the campus? Right, all sorts of things like that. But um, I felt uh, that it's um, it's not it's certainly um, a concern perhaps for some. But I, their policies and practices are quite different. I'll see if I can get the link for that as well and share with the committee. Ms. Seeger. Uh, thank you. I, I feel better hearing that because I you know, don't know. I have an idea of what the reopening plan is looking like, but I didn't realize um, that you have a channel of communication with them. So I really appreciate hearing that that it is, a, you know, being talked about and considered. And and it is, I, I think Amherst College does have a very different relationship with the town. Um, and just, yeah. Anyways, thank you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'll just add that Miss Consolino actually joined the call for me because uh, she's also a helpful person to think these things through. Um, so I want to thank Jill for working a lot of overtime and all the meetings we're asking her to do. Okay. Are there any more? Um, is there any more discussion? If not, um, is somebody willing to make a motion? Miss Dancer? I will read our motion. Um, the Amherst yeah, the Amherst Pelham, Amherst Pelham School Committee fully endorses the request detailed in the Amherst Town Manager's letter dated July 10, 2020 to the Chancellor of University of Massachusetts Amherst, asking for critical changes to the university's plan for students return for the fall semester. And given the urgency of our district's return to school timeline, we call on the university to partner with the town to amend its plan for the fall semester as soon as possible. I believe we will have to vote this, uh, move and vote this um, three separate times. Um, so uh, how about we take that as the Amherst Pelham, the region motion. Is there a second? 
a second. Moved by Stancer, seconded by Spitzer. And um, roll call vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes with the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee, nine to zero. Ms. Hall, would you like to? All right, is there a motion from the Pelham School Committee? <laughs> you did a great job before, Margaret, take it away. <laughs> I don't think you have um, to read it again. I think so okay. moved is fine. Uh, so move uh, for the Pelham School Committee. Okay. Is there a second? Second. second. Great. All right, I'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Mr. Menino? Menino, aye. Ms. Stancer? Stancer, aye. And Hall, aye. Great. Would somebody like to make a motion for the Amherst School Committee? Mr. Demling. I move that the Amherst School Committee uh, fully endorse the request detailed in the Amherst Town Manager's letter as uh, described in the previous two motions. Nice job. <laughs> second. Moved by Demling, second by Harrington. We'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. It passes the Amherst School Committee five to zero. Mr. Demling. Yeah, I was just going to suggest um, that uh, when we, now that it's passed, that, if, that we send it out to the same distribution list that the town manager sent his to. So this would be the chancellor, UMass Community Relations, uh, the Amherst Town Council, and uh, our state representatives, yep. who are very active and supportive of both our public schools and, and of UMass. Yep, we'll take care of that. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, so moving on, um, our next item of new continuing business is our fall 2020 priorities and planning. And um, Ms. Hall, would you like to start us off? Sure, yeah. Um, so in the agenda packet is the uh, framework for planning document that we had first seen at the, at the July 7th meeting. So just to set this up, obviously this is uncharted territory for all of us. Um, so just to clarify that, as the title suggests, this is just a framework document to provide guidance to the superintendent and also to community members about what these three committees priorities and principles are as it relates to fall 2020 planning. Um, it is obviously very short. It is intentionally light on detail because it's meant just to provide guidance and not to be a, an implementation document with a lot of specific that obviously is coming. Um, so this is meant to sort of answer some, but not all of the many questions that are still out there. Um, and I think it, it kind of allows us to continue to be deliberate and thoughtful, um, but also to sort of stay on track as there is obviously a lot of urgency, there's anxiety and uncertainty among teachers and other staff and families and students. Um, so just trying to set up what the purpose of this document is. It's not, it's, it's sort of a step in the process, but it is by no means like the end of, of the process. Ms. McDonald, did you wanna add a little more to set this up? Yeah, sure. Um, and I think it's sort of building on what Ms. Hall just talked about. I think what's really important also to, to think about is that this is, um, it's not our detailed plan. Um, it's, it's a, a statement of our, our values of what's important and what we want to make sure that we see at a minimum in, or at least strive for when we, when the district gets to building those models and those plans. Um, it's, it's not committing us to it, any one particular model or plan at this point, we haven't seen those. Um, and the purpose of this is also to help the district understand that there's so many moving pieces and so many um, dependencies to building those detailed plans. 
And so by narrowing this and stating what our um, values and priorities are as, as the three committees helps the district understand what, what they should be focusing on when, when building those detailed models and plans. Um, so I will say, we, I've said this before when we've talked about this in our, um, in our last meeting, which now feels like ancient history, um, but this is, this is within the context of, of the pandemic. And it is by, it's assuming, so ba referencing back to uh, what Dr. Morris was talking about in his update, that we have um, at least, you know, a green light or a cautious green light that in-person learning um, is, is feasible. Um, so it all depends on what our community spread is, what our local infection rate is, um, and as he referenced the seven day average, whatever those guidance is that we will be getting um, hopefully very soon from DESE and our state public health, um, that's gonna be guiding what we actually do on, on, um, at the start of school. So this is not intended to say, regardless of what anybody else is saying, we are going, we are charging full steam ahead. We're getting those kids in the building. That is not what this document is saying. It's, it's assuming that that guidance is there um, from a public health perspective that this uh, can work. So I, I think in the document, our, our um, original introduction paragraph describes that. We've built in a, some additional clarification in this version that sort of that gets at that as well. Um, the document that's in the packet and, um, and published has yellow highlights for the things that have changed since the last time we discussed this um, at our meetings. Um, those changes were brought, um, were incorporated based on the feedback that we heard from the, our three committees during our last discussion, as well as the virtual town halls that we held um, with community members. And obviously, as Mr. Demling referenced earlier, the volume, the high volume of email and questions that we are getting from, from community and staff. Um, so without um, the other, I think the key, key changes in here, um, we've called out that we will be adjusting our approach as needed in response to changing conditions. Um, we also have added in comments on the in-person learning section that um, we will prioritize special education, ELL, and our youngest grades. Um, for in-person learning, if we are not able, to, if we're not able to hit some of the other metrics um, for providing in-person learning, and we've also stated that we want to, um, we've added to the maximum extent feasible for outdoor learning because we've heard that um, from from all corners of our community that um, outdoor learning is very important. Um, in our distance learning, we've also. Um, indicated that for every grade, students will have the option to choose full-time distance learning. Um, we've also stated um, that we want attendance grades and regular communication with parents to be part of any distance learning plan. And then another key change is that we've, we've pulled out uh, the section and reference um, uh, regarding staff support into a separate document. We have some members who've expressed um, uh, the potential, they, they would like to not be part of those conversations with staff about, regarding staff support um, to avoid uh, potential or perceived conflicts of interest. And um, so those were the, the key changes. What hasn't changed is our overall goals and values, um, which number one on that, we had, and we did number them, was to protect staff and student safety. And that is our overarching um, goal across all of the nuances of the of this plan or this framework. Sorry, I'm trying to use the words appropriately. Um, our, our other value is we want to maximize in-person learning time while maintaining those six feet of physical distance. And third, to invest in and deliver the highest quality distance learning experience possible. So those were our guiding principles and our overall high-level values in our first document, and continue and haven't changed in this one. So. Um, Sarah and I have talked a long, <laughs> a lot. Um, so I will now um, uh, raise your hand if you would uh, like to comment. And I'll also, if uh, I will make sure that everybody has a chance to speak, um, we will go go around the horn, so to speak, um, for those. But if somebody would like to start us off. Mr. Demling. 
Oh, I'm always I'm always willing to go first, and I'm, <laughs> I'm happy not to. Um, so you know, so we've we've talked about the the, the input that we've, we've we've received on this, which has been notable for a few reasons. Obviously, the volume um, has been it's been the highest on any topic I've seen since I've been on school committee three plus years. Um, and the other thing that's very no notable about it is how how thoughtful and and reasoned it's it's been. You know, sometimes on a controversial topic, you'll get angry sort of off the cuff responses. And there's been very little of that. Um, a lot of thoughtful input from, you know, from teachers, parents, members of the community, and ac from across the, the whole spectrum of advocating for full distance learning to full in-person learning. And, you know, like when, when I reflect on the irreconcilable nature of that, um, I'm reminded about, about our, our first meeting when we we very sort of consciously stated that and noticed that there's this inherent tension between maximizing safety and minimizing educational loss. And, and, and because of that, we committed to finding a solution other than just closing schools indefinitely until a vaccine is everywhere, until until COVID's over. Right. And so so knowing that anytime we walk out our, our door during an active pandemic, we're increasing our health risk by some non-zero amount. Um, the, the best guiding principle for me through this has been do the least harm possible for both health and safety and our students' education at the same time, because um, I don't think the uh, the health risk and concern needs any further um, elucidation. Um, but the, the educational loss uh, for a fully in, an indefinite, fully remote approach is real. And it's increasingly unrecoverable the longer that kids go without it, um, you know, which is true for students to varying degrees for all students, but especially for those subgroups of, subgroups of students who can least effectively access distance learning. Um, you know, and we've mentioned these, these groups that our youngest grades, special ed, English language learners, um, our homeless students. And, and there's, there's, there's a ceiling for these students that no amount of prep time or funding is is going to is going to make remote um you know in, increase to, to the level they need and i i just you know one of the core sort of conclusions of this for me has been in this impossible task of balance is i just can't get to a point where i can say to those families the only option we have for the foreseeable future is one that your student can't access i i, I just can't get to that point um uh, unless the local conditions dictated that um, and so, so we have to minimize the health risk. And so that has meant pushing back pretty fiercely if we've been asked to do otherwise. You know, the state came out with this three foot distancing minimum uh, a few weeks ago. And that night we were the first districts in the Commonwealth to say, no, we are sticking to six feet. And since then other districts like Boston and Worcester, Lexington, half a dozen others have, have followed us now. And it's, it's a big debate. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll review this in more detail tomorrow night, but I, I think with with the safeguards that we've put in place, given the status of the local COVID condition, I can comfortably say that of every reopening plan that that I've been able to read in Massachusetts, at least, this is the safest, most deliberately cautious approach that I've seen. And so I, I think I think that our strongest commitment has to be the the flexibility with the model, the the response to changing conditions highlight there in the, in the on on page one. And, and it's it, to me, it's following what Fauci and, and the AAP have been saying recently, which is, um, you know, you need to evolve your, you need to change your approach based on what our, how our understanding of the virus evolves, which is constantly evolving, and your local conditions. And and so that that to me is the real pivot point of where our, our decision making should should lie. So I I think this is the best plan that does the least harm possible in response to current conditions for now. So I feel I feel ready to support this tonight, and um, you know that being said, we have to be ready to change um, based on those two things, based on the understanding of the virus and the and the local conditions. I will say I neglected to one other key key change that we added in um, was the. Uh, the request for a phased in plan for gradual return to in person learning whenever that is. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to speak to like the parts that kind of resonated most to me. And the, like, number one, it was the the uh, the first overall goal, protecting our staff and student safety. 
I think it's very important that that's the message that we are sending to our community right now, that that's our priority. Like there's the, the rush to put a whole bunch of people into the building is not the priority. Safety of our staff and our students, our entire staff and students and, and educating them are that that's the important part here. Right. And so like for me, adding in the option for every grade, students will have the option to choose full time distance learning. I think that kind of like sends the message that we're not forcing anyone to do something, you know, against their will and against, you know, the greater sensibility here. So those those are two aspects that kind of really jumped off the page to me. Overall, I, I think this is a great set of a great, or great framework, I'll say, a great set of guidelines. And, and I appreciate the flexibility and non-rigidity of it. Ms. Dancer. Um, following on what Mr. Harrington said um, about the things that resonated with him, for me, calling out the special education, the ELL, the homeless students, um, I think is critical. Um, if we're going to try to address equity issues, um, we have to do these things. Uh, people who don't have the best access to the internet. So for me, that was really important to see. And the other one was the idea of um, a return in phases. Um, that that speaks to me as well. Ms. Spitzer. Um, I took a bunch of notes and I'm, <laughs> this is, I just want to open up by saying that I think um, this is a really difficult um, problem that we fa face both as policymakers and then also as parents or educators or you know people who, who are connected to the schools in any way so and and it's so difficult because we have seen a failure at the federal level on so many levels and I think what we're seeing across the country makes the thought of reopening schools absolutely terrifying but when I look at my community and I look at the fact that today I was looking at the dashboard and our testing positive rate was 1.6%, which is well, well below that 5% threshold. I feel reassured and I feel um, not that the risk is zero, but that what we're proposing um, is, is reasonable. But the key is again, being flexible and, and pay attention not only to the changes in the rates that we're seeing in our community, but also paying attention to research that's coming out. So a few days ago, there was a new study from South Korea that, you know, sort of changed my thinking about the potential for, you know, this idea of prioritizing younger kids over middle school and high school teachers based on some of the data we were seeing. So I just want to say, like, there is no situation where we're going to be able to say there is no risk. And I think even before COVID, there was no situation where we could say we're going to 100%, you know, protect your children from getting a virus that could, um, you know, seriously harm them. So I also know that parents are exhausted and we are all kind of doing our best to make these decisions. So I think this document is is the best we can do in the current situation. And I like the fact that we're prioritizing younger kids. I like the fact that we're prioritizing those um, with IEPs, English language learners. Um, in other documents we're talking about um, also prioritizing homeless students. And I think that's right because I think a lot of us in the community who are most vocal may also um, often not be connected to some of these communities that may find it hardest to engage in distance learning. Folks who are, you know, working multiple jobs and uh, may not have the time. So um, the thing that I'm still somewhat uncomfortable with, and, and um, most of the folks who have spoken earlier may have conflicts where they can't talk about the staff piece, but I, I don't have any of those conflicts. So I, I think I like the fact that we are stating explicitly that we will provide accommodations for staff who have underlying medical conditions. I am sorry to interrupt. Um, yeah. I should have stated this up front. We're gonna, we're, um, we're, the way we're oh, gonna- We're actually not talking about, okay. Okay, so then I'll leave my comments on the staff piece. <laughs> but but so then I'll just leave with, end with one thing. So it's a little confusing to me that we state the district will provide accommodations to students who have underlying medical conditions um, for, 
and always provide them with remote distance learning. But now we're also saying the first bullet of the distance learning for every grade, students will have the option to choose full-time distance learning. I'm just a little, are there additional accommodations that we think beyond just full-time distance learning that we would be doing for folks who have underlying medical conditions? Or is it redundant to say that distance learning is going to be an option for everybody? And then I'll save my comments about the staff piece for later. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah. I just, I just understand. yeah. We are talking only about the the first two pages of this framework that that stop with the line support for staff guidance related to staff as described in a separate section. And once those folks that feel they have a conflict of interest um, have have retired, or um, then we will continue with this that second um, portion. Sorry, Mr. Demling. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say my my interpretation is that technically it is redundant. Um, but it's calling out two different. It's calling out the same answer to two different questions. One is, what if my child has a medical condition? Will you offer remote learning? The answer is yes. What if, for whatever reason, I don't feel comfortable or I choose to have my child do remote learning? Will that be supported? The answer is that's also yes. <laughs> um, so I think it, it's coming from two different audiences. But I think you're right that it's it's technically a redundancy. Um, that second bullet also gives an opportunity to call out. Uh, this other addition that we added that um, uh, the district will provide opportunities to change this choice at different points during the school year, frequency to be determined. So this is the idea that uh, periodically, every X number of months, uh, a parent could say, you know what, my child's been remote, now I want them to come back if, if, that, if that's something that's part of the, the current model. Uh, we haven't gotten into the details yet uh, with Dr. Morris, who has his hand raised. <laughs> um, but I think that was another reason to, to have that bullet there. Dr. Morris. So to very, very briefly add to Mr. Dunling's comment and uh, attempt not to open uh, yeah. a, a rabbit hole, um, there may be situations in the future, much like Mr. Deming said, where students choose to return um, because either conditions improve, comfort level improves, whatever. Uh, but it also could be the case that a vaccine that comes out in the future is 80% effective. And that might change the comfort level of many. It may not change the comfort level long term about someone with pre-existing uh, medical conditions. So, you know, from my perspective, obviously it's your document. I would support having it separate because it could be the case that uh, many students can return to, I don't want to say normal, but return back to larger percentages being in school. Whereas for some students, um, this has always been the situation. Some we have students who can't come to school pre-COVID because of this. And, um, you know, it may be a longer road for them to return. Uh, I like that, like talking about post COVID, but it may not post COVID for some may not be post COVID for others. So um, that's, I think, the other piece about highlighting that is this is not a short term thing. Um, and this isn't getting into your guessing, anyone's guessing games about vaccines, but, um, you know, vaccines may come out that are primarily effective, but uh, may not address every, every child's health needs. Um, not seeing any more raised hands, so I'll, I'll, I'll um, oh, Miss Seeger. <laughs> I just want to say a lot of the stuff, like with everybody else, resonates with me in here. I particularly like a phase that that it includes a phase and approach. Um, one point on under the staff and student safety, it says we'll include guidance from the Centers for Dis Centers for Disease Control, American Academy of Pediatrics the state and local public health officials. Um, I'm an engineer, so forgive me, but I don't wanna book, uh, bookend us into just these sources. Um, I wouldn't mind it saying something to, to the regards of any peer reviewed science on this matter um, or the WHO as well. You know, I, I feel like in our country, unfortunately the CDC seems to be coming undermined um, and there's some stuff in the New York American Academy of Pediatrics that um, when I read through their stuff, it was like three feet's okay for kids, but six feet's for adults. And I just, I would love broad sources um, in there. And that, that's all the comments I have. Um, Mr. Demling, are you responding to Ms. Seeger? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, if the committee's comfortable with it, if if they feel like it has the same sentiment as what's currently written, we could alter that to um, amend it to 
Uh, we will in include, but not be limited to guidance from et cetera. And then that allows us the freedom to uh, evaluate. Great, thank you. Um, Ms. Ms. Lord. Yes, <clears throat> for the first overall goal of protect staff and student safety, I don't see us really addressing mental health. Um, I know a lot of, we're not gonna talk about staff, but there's a lot of um, mental health stuff around coming back to school, not coming back to school, um, the different intergenerational families we might live with. So I would love if we could find a way to put a bullet point in about that, or at least open up talking about, because to me, mental health is also another part of that health and safety. Um, I appreciate the new phased approach as, if we have 20,000 people coming to this town, our, uh, our rates might change. And then I wanna to speak to the families um, that are most vulnerable to the equitable issues and or have always been. I feel like we really need to talk to more of them. Um, I heard two public comments about, you haven't reached out to me, what are you thinking? I've been trying to talk to a few and and we might, not understand what their needs or desires might be as much as we think we might be looking at metrics and not getting behind and but I I, I really implore us to try to find a way <laughs> if well you know call whatever it is but just to get a little bit more input from those families thank you so I'm going to look uh, there's a, a couple folks that haven't spoken up yet um, Mr. Menino do you have anything to add? Um, it's a thoughtful, it's a cautious expression of our values with respect to safety and education. It's something this committee should be proud of. I'm not sure how this fits in, but uh, I still have concerns about uh, in-school and virus uh, transmission. The CDC came out with something today that said fourth graders and up can just be a transmitter as, as an adult. And what does that mean for uh, in-school elementary education? But it, it, it's, it's a good compromise. It's something that uh, says we understand the issues. Um, I've read something like, I read every article that appears in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times that has to do with education, I read. It's, it's it's I'm retired. I, I'm uh, I'm con this this issue is consuming me. Basically, there's evidence out there supporting any position you want to take, and this seems like a healthy compromise. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Ms. Kenny, did you want to speak to this at all? Oh boy. Um... I'm not sure I have well articulated thoughts and feelings just yet. I do have lots of thoughts and feelings. I'm just not sure how to, they all fit together in a nice, <laughs> neat, articulate package just yet. <laughs> Thank you though. I'm sure uh, you're not alone in that. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, well, we can uh, come back. I'll keep an eye on you and raise your okay. hand. Um, Mr. Sullivan, did you want to uh, add any comments? Not, not at this time, thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Hall. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I also have trouble being articulate about it. It is all very overwhelming. I think for me, the the phased in part of it, I think, um, makes me a little bit more comfortable with this document. And um, and I don't, I don't think there is a way to really be comfortable with this. I don't think there's anything that we're gonna do that's gonna make everybody be like, we're right. Like we nailed it. We got the right data and we did it the right way. And we, in our little bubble here in the Pioneer Valley did it exactly right. Um, but I think the fact that it's open for flexibility, that it's focused on data and on like 
uh, as Ms. Lord said, sort of like sort of trying to get at the real authentic needs of students and staff. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a really good framework and sort of goal document that um, I feel good getting behind. Thank you. I'll just, uh, listening to everybody, um, um, I have the benefit I can go last um, and <laughs> choose to go last. Um, but I, I think, you know, there's a, going all the way back to uh, something that Mr. Demling um, touched on, which is this idea that we're, what we're trying to do is, you know, if there's, it's, I don't want to use the word um, win because it because it's not about winning. But I think you know, and again, what you just said about being uncomfortable. At the, no matter where we land, it's going to be it's going to feel uncomfortable. Um, and and we're because we're balancing um, goals that are inherently opposing or opposite, right? So as Mr. Demling was talking, like that we. We're trying to protect from the the health risks of the of the pandemic. The best solution is to just is to stay in lockdown. But at the same time, we know that we that there is tremendous learning loss and risk for long term learning loss and and negative impacts on specific specific populations, but in general as well, um, for remaining in lockdown and 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 staying out of school and remaining in one hundred percent distance learning. Um, and so how how do we how do we manage those? Um, because we we can't sort of put our heads in the sand and pick one or the other because we're going to be failing in in in, in many ways on on the other. Um, and if our mission is to educate our students um, and and provide that education so that they can have impactful and and, and um, uh, lives, um, all of our students, then then we we can't choose one. Or the other end of that spectrum, and I and I do feel that what we've pulled together collaboratively here, um, with significant input from the community and staff, I will add, because this has changed um, over the last ten days. Um, I, I do feel we've struck a balance here that, um, as Ms. Hall suggested, is still going to feel uncomfortable um, as as we work our way through to it. But I, I do feel we've expressed our values. Um, very strongly here, and I um, can get behind this um, wholeheartedly, as wholeheartedly as I can in a pandemic. <laughs> Mr. Demling. Yeah, I just, so two two unrelated things. Um, one is, you know, I, I did want to acknowledge that while I feel like this is the best plan under the current conditions that does the least harm possible, doing the least harm possible still means harm, <laughs> which is which is the really painful exercise of striking this balance. Um, you know, so there, there are aspects of this that, that I continue to feel movement on in, in what I think is the best thing to do. And I'm not totally settled on. And, and it's it's funny, like just to break the fourth wall of school committee for like a half a second. You know, I feel like when, when public bodies make these big decisions, there's, there's this need to sort of broadcast confidence that, you know, you know what you're doing and everyone feels 100 um, percent. You know, but I don't feel a hundred percent on every aspect of this, and and I still today, you know, reading input, I feel moved. So for you know, I just, so I just wanted to know a specific example, like number of days uh, on site for seven to twelve. I've I've heard some pretty compelling arguments for for one versus two, maybe zero versus one. I, I'm I'm not I'm not entirely sure, um, and so I don't want to open up that entire can again. I, I feel I feel good with with the framework that we have. And, um, but, you know, I just, I just wanted to acknowledge that reality. Uh, the other thing is responding to um, what Ms. Lord said about social emotional needs. Um, so I just, I just sent a, a chat that I don't know if it shows up. So this is a, something we might be able to add to the, um, uh, to the staff and student safety section. So something like meeting social emotional needs of our students will be a primary goal of both distance and in-person learning throughout the school year um, to try and capture the the, the value that uh, Ms. Lord was talking about. So I don't know if, what y'all think of that. Seeing nodding heads and thumbs up. 
So we have uh, two uh, minor amendments. Well, not minor, I shouldn't say. Two amendments um, to this document. Um, one is in, both are under staff and student safety. One is in that second um, section of the first bullet, we will include, um, but not be limited to guidance. Um, so we're adding, but not be limited to. Um, and then the other change is to add the bullet that Mr. Demling just described about social emotional well-being. Ms. Penny, are you feeling any more um, eloquent at this point, or? <laughs> no. <laughs> Mr. Menino, you had you raised your hand. No, I was saying good night to my granddaughter. Okay. <laughs> Um, Ms. Kenny, and then Ms. Dancer. Okay, so I guess I have a few feelings, right? I really appreciate that it one of the first overreaching goals is the highest quality of distance learning, um, because I think focusing our time and efforts there, because that is the brand new piece, right? Like we have great teachers that are really great in the classroom, but who have never done the distance learning piece. So I think being able to have that being one of our overreaching goals where that is one of our highest priorities, I think that's super important. I also really appreciate making sure that we are meeting the social emotional needs of both the students and the staff, because I think that is going to be really, really important. Um, I don't know about anybody else's family, but our household super struggled with that piece of the whole emergency remote learning part. Um, and um, the the phase in approach, I think, is a fantastic ad, um, along with the option for students to have full time distance learning with some points where people can make different decisions. I guess my only question, or one of my questions would be, if you chose in school learning and then something changes for your family, can you then whoop, go be part of the distance learning team? Um, and yes, I think that's as articulate as I can be right now. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Morris? Yeah, that is that. It's it depends which way you're going. That way is much less problematic. Uh, really, what the what it would be much more challenging for the staff was someone who started in distance learning and after two weeks wanted to be in the class, because we're going to build our classes based on students who are coming. And you know, not that there's not one space, but uh, having that disruption. Uh, it would be really hard when there's so much work that staff are going to have to do to build that classroom community in a distance way to have a, a kind of up and down enrollments is not something for the in school that we think is in the best interest. And also, you know, we're trying to do orientations around health and safety with students and, and families before they return. And so there's some like logistical limitation on how often we can do that and build in systems and supports uh, for families. So uh, going the other way doesn't involve the same degree of orientation and health and safety needs that uh, coming to the in-person would. Ms. Lord? Yes, and I'm sorry if I missed it because I do remember it being mentioned a little, but I don't see a section that would address how we um, deal with if somebody in a class tests positive, is the whole class then quarantined, our siblings, um, would we have a framework for for those things as well. My 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 sense, my take, and I, I open to hearing other other committee members' ideas on this. But um, that that's that that's getting into the plan um, and protocols as opposed to guidance. I think sort of covered in the maximize you know protect staff and student safety. Um, is it you know, is our number one goal and and all of the things falling from that? But I, okay, Thank you. Mr. Harrington, and then Miss Dancer. Yeah, I'm, 
I'm not I'm not hung up hung up on on the second goal because I see it within the first bulletin point there. But I, I was just wondering if we could uh, add some clarity to the fact that you know maximizing in person and learning time while maintaining six foot physical distance also kind of folds into the fact that we will adjust our approach as needed in response to changing conditions. I, j- I just don't want people to feel like like we're forging ahead with the, the, the in-person aspect of all of this. So I think what you were, um, Mr. Harrington, you were proposing that we take that adjusting as needed in response to changing conditions into the overall goal. Is that? Um, maybe. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm also not super eloquent at the moment, too, so I'm, I'm dealing with that curve. But yeah, I don't know if they necessarily have to be together because they're both, you know, part of the same document. But maybe a when possible on the number two or or some something to that effect. I don't I don't know. Mm. Um, I saw two hands, Ms. Spitzer and Mr. Demling. Did were you responding to that, Ms. Spitzer? So I had a similar concern last week. I feel like focusing in on the six foot of physical distance um, is kind of calling out one of many ways that we work to keep people safe when they're in our school buildings. And I'm not sure why, I mean, I think it's important and it's an area where we were making a clean break from the DESE guidance. And I think maybe it's the point is that we're gonna go with whatever is, you know, the strictest guidance about being in person um, in order to keep our folks safe. So I, I, you know, I, I said it last week, I still feel the same way. I, I didn't feel the need to repeat myself, but um, I, I agree with Ben. I'm not sure exactly how to say it more eloquently, but I think this idea of, you know, it, we're not gonna maximize in-person learning if it's not safe. And, and six feet of physical distance isn't the only way to keep, keep us safe. And, and putting it in, uh, overall goal to me feels like you're moving from a goal to an actual implementation piece. Like the six foot of physical distance is a way we keep people safe. So that's why I I, I, I made something similar comment last week. I don't know if people have better ideas on how to say it. I think the way you just said that is actually, <laughs> you're feeling not eloquent, but you sounded good. Um, the, the maximize in-person learning time while well, um, meeting the staff and student safety, something along you know the the staff and student safety guidelines that we've detailed below, Dr. Morris. Yeah, just the way that I'm continuing to to hear uh, public health experts talk about this, uh, and I don't have the great. I'm not in the. I'm not on the articulate train either, so I'm, I'll just bear with me. But um, is something around uh, the language I keep hearing is like a suite of safety. Um, measures, it's not just the six feet, it's also the mask wearing, it's also the ventilation. So I think calling out six feet, you know, especially when that was a novel thing a couple of weeks ago, uh, made a lot of sense. That's not a critique of having included, but I wonder if, you know, I don't know if sweet's the right word, but just, you know, everything that I read from public health is that it's not one thing. It's actually multiple health and safety measures that one takes and maybe that's a language that we, you know, that, that gets shifted from an isolated six foot is one measure, but it's actually, again, the, the range of measures that complement each other. Yep. Um, um, Ms. Kenny and then Mr. Menino. So what if um, we take out the while maintaining six feet of physical distance and put in there something about uh, maximize in-person learning time while following health and safety guidance from the people as listed below or something along those lines because we then go on later to say the six feet, the masks, and who we're taking guidance from. So, in, you know, as more of like a, like, we're going to pay attention to what is happening. So maybe something more like that, like maximizing in-person learning time while there was something else, while, I don't know, <laughs> got halfway. <laughs> um, now I forget who is next, Mr. Menino, and then. I'd advocate uh, keeping the six foot uh, criteria in. It was one of the hallmark uh, 
hallmark conditions this committee brought forth. Uh, it was in direct response to the DESE uh, proposal that you have three feet. Uh, you could add uh, adjusting our approach as needed in response to changing conditions, which would make it cumbersome if you want to indicate that, uh, that, that there are things other than six foot that would make it safe. But I, I just like the idea that six foot is right near the top in overall goals rather than down in um, the reopening plan criteria. But that's just my opinion. Um, Mr. Demling and then Mr. Harrington. All right, possible solution to that would satisfy both of those requests is that um, right now under staff and student safety, the third bullet is the reopening plan will be designed as much as possible with requirements that at least six foot physical distance. So let's say we take that entire third bullet section and then that becomes the first bullet under staff and student safety. So the first detail that you see in the first section mentions the six feet. That could allow you to then reword goal number two to say maximize in-person learning time. And then something like with a suite of safety protocols in response to, to prevailing conditions. That way you're, you're, you're talking about safety, you're tying safety to the in-person learning time. You still have your six foot prominence in that first bullet under staff and student safety. <laughs> I was seeing a lot of naughty. Woo! <laughs> I had one other suggestion. Um, so Mr. Harrington had talked about, you know, how to maybe further highlight or make more prominent the adjusting our approach as needed in response to changing conditions. We, we, we could just make that the fourth goal. We could say that the fourth goal is we will adjust our approach as needed in response to changing conditions. And then that, and that really is a more general guidance of, of all the detail that then follows. Ms. Seeger. Oh, I don't know if Mr. Harrington was going to say this, but but I think that's a great goal for the fourth goal, and I would love to word it something like, um, oh, it just slipped my mind. Uh, remaining flexible to adjust to the conditions as they change, it sounds more goal-like than, I don't know, just a wording thing. Um, so we're much more articulate and productive at 8, 815 than at 1015. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to try, I, I think, so, um, I'm going to trust, I'm taking notes, but I'm trusting also that CLA, you've helped us with, uh, taking some good notes on changes here. But, um, just to recap, we are proposing to change goal number two. Um, so that it reads, maximize in-person learning time with a suite of safety protocols. And I can't remember the, exactly, but it was the... the um, in response to prevailing conditions. Thank you. And then we are adding a fourth overall goal that is um, we will remain flexible and adjust our approach as needed in response to changing conditions. Is that? And moving the third bullet point up. Correct. And move the third bullet up. Um, we are also adding the other two changes, the social emotional needs in this uh, staff and student safety section. Um, and then adding, but not limited to, to where we're going to look for guidance. Since we know that we, um, well, I, I don't know. Um, how are folks uh, feeling about um, voting on this with the notation that as amended, as, dis, as amended, as discussed? Um, or would we like to table the vote? Wow, good. Seeing lots of thumbs up. Okay. Um, and as mentioned, we're only, um, we would only be voting on the first two pages of this guidance. Um, and then we will um, 
allow any any committee members who would like to to excuse themselves um, from the discussion on the remaining page of staff guidance. Would Miss Kenny? Sorry, can you just um, repeat how what goal four? How that's going to read? Um. I scribbled this down, so please, if somebody has this better, um, we will remain flexible and adjust our approach. Uh, sorry, we will remain flexible and adjust our approach as needed in response to changing conditions. Thank you. Okay. Would somebody from the region like to make a motion? Mr. Demling. I move to approve the framework for planning uh, for, for fall 2020 as amended. Second. Moved by Demling, seconded by Spitzer. We'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spencer. Dancer, aye. And Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes the region nine to zero. Uh, Ms. Hall, would you like to? Sure. I'll entertain a, a motion from the Pelham School Committee. I move that the Pelham School Committee accept the framework for planning for fall 2020 as amended. Second. Great, all right, I'll take a roll call vote. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. And Hall, aye. Um, and I will make a motion for the Amherst School Committee. I move that we accept, that we approve the fall 2020 reopening framework for planning for the Amherst schools as amended. Is there a second? Second. Moved by McDonald, seconded by Harrington. Um, roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Uh, Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. The motion passes Amherst five to zero. Thank you, everyone. I will make the, the necessary edits to this document um, and send uh, to the committee and to CLO uh, tomorrow morning. Um, and now we'll move on to the next portion, um, looking at the second section, page, or third page, sorry, of the document. Um, and it, for any members that uh, 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 believe that they have a conflict of interest or a perceived conflict of interest, um, uh, would you like to recuse yourself from this discussion? Mr. Demling? Yeah, for the record, I'm re recusing myself from discussing the document, given that my wife is an employee of the Amherst School District. And while there's no monetary component here that would create a conflict of interest, I'd like to avoid any appearance of a conflict. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to mute and turn my video off and I uh, will join you after the item. Thank you. Mr. Harrington? Yeah, as, as an employee of the district, I'm also going to recuse myself and uh, step away and mute and come back after. Great. I will chat you both to come back. Ms. Stanford? Um, because I have a family member who works in the school district, I am also going to recuse myself. But I also have a question. 
If I mute myself and turn off my video, how do I know when to come back? Um, I will, if you if you are still in the Google Meets, I will send a chat um, awesome. to everybody. Great, thank you. Great. Mr. Menino. I have a question, how do you get a chat? <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's the little, in the upper right corner of your screen, there's a little white section with a lot of icons and the one that's just to the left of the time it looks like a little talk box, like a comic strip. Oh, it's got a person. Oh, a little, a little bubble and a sheet. Yes, yeah, I, see I see it now. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so as as mentioned before, we separated the staff sections out um, and and actually added to it from the first time that we looked at it. So. Um, um, most of these are new from the last meeting that we reviewed them. So we've, um, what we had before was the district will provide reasonable accommodations for staff with underlying medical conditions. Um, we've added also district will seek to accommodate staff who for any reason, including concerns about household members who may be vulnerable, express a preference for full or mostly remote work to the extent that such positions are needed and available and based on the instructional model and student preferences. And we also added that the district will work with the leadership of a, a collective bargaining units to try to address other points of concern to staff. Um, and then continuing from the, the last bullet on this in the page um, has not changed from the first time, which is that staff will be provided the support in time, training and professional development to adapt to the requirements of both in-person and distance learning instructional models. Anybody have any um, comments on this document? Ms. Kenny. Um, so as we change the first overall goals um, on the framework for planning, should we adjust these goals so they match up? Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Ms. Spitzer, you had had comments before, um, so we'll start with you. And then uh, Ms. Lord, I see your hand, so you'll be next. I feel like I'm talking a lot tonight. I was trying to give other folks a chance to, to respond. So I, I guess this is the theme of planning during COVID is that things you care a lot about are often in direct opposition to one another. Um, so, you know, the idea of, um, all of this sounds great to me. I, I'm particularly concerned with the fact that we may end up having a situation where there is a mismatch between the preferences of our students and the preferences of our staff. And I feel like the way this is currently worded, um, and you know, I'm aware that this will probably be negotiated at a later date, so I, I wanna be careful, but it, you know, will provide reasonable accommodation and will seek to accommodate staff for any reason. Like that, that's our goal. But if we end up in a situation where we have more students who are interested in in-person learning and fewer staff who are interested in being in the buildings and serving in, in that capacity, then we're gonna be facing a problem. And it, the way I'm reading this document now, um, it errs on the side to my reading of putting um, staff potentially in buildings if they are, even if they are uncomfortable with that option, even if their preference would be to do um, remote learning. And so that's where I'm feeling really uncomfortable and I'm not sure how to um, reconcile these two competing interests. So um, I, for one, would feel, you know, just really uncomfortable um, with that type of situation of forcing somebody to go into a building if they feel that it's not safe for whatever reason it is. And I also believe that, you know, it's gonna be very difficult to, um, you know, you'd have a situation where folks with easy access to doctors willing to write medical notes is going to, you know, not be evenly distributed throughout our staff, even though hopefully all of our staff have access to, to healthcare, healthcare and health insurance. Um, 
so I, I just want to put that out there because it's been what's honestly out of all of this. Um, you know, we're giving our students the option of choosing distance learning or being in person, but I, it's it's the thing that's keeping me up at night. It's the thing that I'm I'm perseverating on quite a bit. So I'd like to hear what others are thinking, and um, thank you, Mr. Menino. How do you propose to solve that conflict? That's what I'm saying. It's an impossible situation. Like all of this pandemic planning has been for me. Um, but I think it's it's the one where, you know, it's 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 really difficult. Um, Dr. Morris, and then Ms. Lord, I know you've been waiting. Sorry. I, I can wait for Ms. Lord to jump in. I just had one comment on one thing Ms. Spitzer said, not on her larger points. So why don't we go to Ms. Lord and I'll, I'll be okay. patient. Well, I just really want to echo what Ms. Spitzer brought up um, around staff, the, the mismatch. I don't see here articulated that a staff could start one way and also switch if they needed to, like we articulated for the students. Like if you start in person, is there flexibility to then go to remote? And yes, it's uh, very challenging. And then I'm confused a little bit about the co collective bargaining. So when a union yeah, but that's just me new to the school committee about going against their recommendation and what the ramifications might be for that. But I will learn. Thank you. Dr. Morris, did you want to? Um, I was just going to say on one particular point that Ms. Spitzer made, so we did already ask staff um, not what their condition was, but whether they had a condition you know, that met the CDC list that is uh, our legal guide for that. Um, and there were follow-up calls made by our human resources office, but there wasn't documentation required. Um, it's really just trying to understand that. I think at some point there may be a need for that, um, you know, legally to cover our bases and we're in contact with our legal counsel about that, but it was not, please send in a letter from a doctor about it, it was really uh, the question. I think the wording was something similar. You know, do you have a condition? You know, that you know consistent with CDC piece. Um, but I just wanted. We were very attuned to the point around equity and the capacity of some to get doctors' notes versus others and all that. But it was really just an open-ended question, or it was not an open. It was a close, close-ended. It was a multiple choice: yes, no, and that we were going to follow up by phone for all the reasons that you cited. Yeah, I, I'm not speaking to the larger point, but I just thought that was important given the comment that you made. Ms. Seeger and then Ms. Hall. Does, so bullet one is accommodating folks with underlying medical conditions. Bullet two is about seeking to accommodate staff who for any reason, including concerns about household members may be vulnerable, um, expressing a preference for full or mostly remote work. I've heard about teachers who have children and if their children are in some sort of program like ours where they're in one or two days a week, but home three days, um, does bullet two, is that a way to help these families so that these these folks can still work? Or is that a separate concern? Because that's really important to me that we have that space as well to support them. Dr. Morris? If, I, if I'm understanding your comment, and, and I apologize, I may not be, uh, which is my fatigue, not your lack of clarity. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons we're exploring childcare options for staff who um, would be working in the building, that they would have days where, you know, and there's, you know, our, we have staff members who probably, with kids who attend 20 different districts, I'm guessing. And that's not a real number. We don't, we don't have that catalog, but that'd be, I think a reasonable estimate. So separate from whatever we do in our district, we're gonna have staff who have the conflict that you cite. And that's really why we're trying to work on um, explicitly having childcare, you know, particularly for elementary age kids uh, of staff members um, to be able to provide that service for staff members who come into work. And Ms. Hall, you had your hand raised earlier. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that Ms. Spitzer's concern is an important one, certainly one um, that I share. And I don't, you know, I certainly don't have like a, a really clean, great response. Um, but I think for me, it, uh, some of it just really hinges on chronology. Like we, this document is something that is sending a message to the superintendent saying, this is what we care about. So, you know, we have our overall framework 
planning document. And then we have the staff one that calls this out specifically that says we care not just about staff who have potentially underlying medical conditions, but just staff generally. Um, but it seems like in order to even get at any kind of numbers and any level of specificity, we need to have this document that says here, district, here are our priorities so that the district can start to get into a lot of those specifics so that we can then present a plan that then teachers and families can actually make a decision on. And I think if we, yeah, I guess I just get concerned about continuing to talk for too long and then not having an opportunity to present something so that people can actually make a decision. Which, and I, I say that not to like stifle discussion on this document or anything. Um, I guess I, that's just something that maybe, that makes me feel a little bit better about voting on something that still makes me feel not great. Meaning like we're gonna have to make these really difficult decisions that weigh heavily on us because they have a real and immediate impact on human lives. But um, I think if we're gonna, we're gonna have to kind of make these slightly uncomfortable things so that we can actually have something so people can say, okay, yes, I'm in for in-person if that's available or no, I'm not, or have that information. And then we can start, you know, we'll have to rely on the flexibility built into the document that says, okay, well, we got this information back. Now we have to change our approach a little bit. Yeah, I was like, um, sort of as I as I think through this too. I mean, we added that second bullet specifically to recognizing that we're all struggling with that 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 conundrum, right? That you you know, how do we how do we accommodate them? And we specifically put that in there. So I think you know, rather than looking at it as are we guaranteeing that staff will can, can work. Um, 100% remote if they want to. I'm, I look at it from the other perspective is we didn't have that in there originally. And if we didn't put this bullet in here, we would, by having this bullet in here, we're telling the district that this is important to us, that staff be at least asked what their preference was and, and sort of try to accommodate those as much as we can. And to Ms. Hall's point, I do think if we're putting the stake in the, in the, in the uh, no, that's a wrong analogy because it isn't, it isn't carved in stone. This is guidance and we're saying by voting on this, if we choose to vote on this tonight, we're saying that this is important to us to seek as much as possible to accommodate staff preference. And then once we get to the, the detailed models and plans, then staff and families have something that they can react to and decide on. And we'll find out at that point how much further we need to go into in refining those plans um, and, um, and accommodating people's desires at that point. Um, Mr. Menino? The goal says the district will seek to accommodate, not promise. Ms. I guess that's, I guess that's the thing. I feel like if we, want, if we felt strongly, if this is truly a statement of our goals and our values, we are inherently creating a situation in which we potentially will have to decide between, and maybe it'll work out. Maybe everything will, but the, I'm being a bit of a pessimist this day because the news is, everything seems to be going the negative way. But anyways, so ideally what will happen is we will poll students, we'll poll teachers and we'll have a perfect match and we'll be able to meet the needs of all of our students with these staff who and, and accommodate their preferences. But if, if if our goal statement doesn't state which, when we come to this juncture where we might have a mismatch, if it doesn't state which way we're going to go, then is it really gu gu providing guidance for the district? I guess that's my question. Like I, I I feel if if this isn't binding, then that's fine. I think it's good to say that you know. But but if it does turn into a binding situation there is this mismatch and Dr. Morris looks at this and says, well, we prioritized accommodate, you know, getting as many students in the building as possible, but we don't have enough teachers. So what I'm going to do is ask Joe, you know, who said he'd prefer to work remote and I'm going to tell him he needs to work in person. I would feel terrible if Joe ends up getting COVID and can't, you know, I guess that's the thing that like at the end of the day, that's the thing that I will not feel you know, I, I my conscience is getting in the way. 
So if, if we're saying that this is just a statement of preferences, but it, we're saying it's actually guiding principles and that people are gonna be making decisions on this. So that that's why I, I'm feeling really uncomfortable. Um, and I I may be the only one here who's, who's feeling so strongly about it. Um, and I'm, I think it is good. I think we are doing a lot more than other districts and I wanna acknowledge that and that this was added and I'm not saying anything, but, th but that's the thing that I'm, I'm feeling uncomfortable with. I think the struggle is, is that we can't promise both. We can't promise that all students, that families that want, their stu want and need their students in school can, be, can have that option and promise that all teachers that want to be um, working remote can. We can't, we can't commit at this point to doing both because you're absolutely right. We may end up with a mismatch. And I don't think that you're um, alone in in sort of feeling that really weighing on our consciences, right? Like I, th I think you know we uh, we listened to the the tremendous amount of of, pu of public comment this evening. Um, that that fear and that um, concern is real and and I th and shared. I think I met, I'm I'm speaking only for myself, but I, I I you know I see the 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 expressions on our faces as we listen to this and as we talk about this. So I, I don't, I feel as if we, we can't sort of put that in a guiding framework and commit to providing and meeting everybody's wishes because it, 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 it puts the district in a position that they can't actually deliver on what we're asking and, and demanding of the district at that point. So do we, do we, set them up to not be able to meet our guidance or do we tr do we position something that says this is what we want you to work really hard to achieve if we can and and by phrasing it this way we, we will seek to accommodate you're absolutely right we're putting the, the a slight priority on on meeting the student and family needs than we are on the staff needs and that feels icky it, it it really, really does. And so I'm not, you know, as I, as I say that, but I don't, I think <laughs> Mr. Menino's question, and I'm sorry, I didn't mean to giggle to make light of this because um, it's, it's a very, very serious. Um, but I, I think you said at the very beginning, Mr. Menino, what do, what do we do, right? And, and I think um, it's, it's, it's the struggle as, as we've all been saying of this really uncomfortable and, and just, bad situation of being in a pandemic and having to figure out and, and, and chart a path forward. Um, I, I feel I'm hopeful, um, but I'm not sort of banging this whole, you know, betting the whole, the whole framework on, on hope for the best. Um, but I, I, we hear enough um, from uh, both ends of the spectrum from families as well as from from staff um, in terms of wanting to be in school and not be in school um, and we'll we'll have to address it if there is a mismatch and and have those uncomfortable discussions um, and and tough really tough discussions when if we when we get there is um, just my take on this um, I saw a hand up before and I'm not sure who it was was it you miss Seeger Nope. Um, so, so far I have the amendments to this are the identical ones that we made on the previous one on the overall goals. So changing um, overall goal number two um, and adding um, overall goal number four that we added um, to the the main document. Are there any other comments or ads or Ms. Kenny? So I guess I have mostly a question. So bullet point three, working with leadership of the collective bargaining units, um, will that sort of help mitigate Bar, uh, number two, if there's a mismatch. So if if there's more students than there are teachers that are per, need slash want to be in school, will that then, I guess, 
will like the teachers union be stepping in and somehow I, I guess I, I share the same concerns and the thought of putting someone in a classroom when it's either themselves or their family members that will be put at risk. I, I don't know that I could ask somebody to do that. So I guess that's, yeah, <laughs> that's it. Thank you. I have similar questions because I know the teachers union in Florida is now suing the state over being forced to go back. So, you know, thank you for helping me articulate it a little better. <laughs> what is what's going on? And then I know we also did a survey once upon a time of the staff. And I'm wondering, not that they want to do a million surveys, but the shift, the tides might have changed. People might feel differently. And if there was a way it could actually be anonymous so that I don't have to worry that, you know, my promotion or my, my position might be um, threatened if I say I don't want to go back to work for whatever reason. That might help get um, answers that feel less scary to give. And Ms. Seeger. Yeah, sort of tacking on to what Ms. Lord was saying, I was wondering if there should be some sort of bullet point under here about um, communication and, you know, hoping in this framework that we provide or create some form of communication. I mean, there will be dialogue. I'm sure there's dialogue between administration and staff, but just sort of a way to say that um, there's a way to give feedback or something as the the um, semester goes on, you know, stuff like that, that it is a continuous iteration and, and they will be listened to. I don't know if that's appropriate to put here. I'm sure that will be happening anyways, but it is sort of a, I don't know. Can you um, restate what you, <laughs> the bullet you, that you were, that you were suggesting adding about community? Good question. <laughs> um, the district will provide, I don't know, a method of feedback or communication. Somebody I'm sure here can say it maybe more eloquently than me, but, um, or provide opportunities for feedback as the semester goes on. Mm-hmm. I, I, I was thinking um, about your your comment, Ms. Lord, um, about surveying staff because I, it's also true, necessary for families um, because our original survey back in probably was only about four weeks ago, but it feels like ages ago. But um, uh, we had eight over eighty percent of families said they wanted in person learning, and just judging from the the volume of mail that we're getting, I'm bet that it's much lower than that. Um, so I would suspect that it's also shifted um, among staff as well. And so, um, you know, that that getting that feedback um, will be important. We're kind of bleeding into maybe another agenda topic for another meeting. But um, uh, I do agree that that's that sort of taking that that pulse is, is going to be important because I'm sure it's changed and it will continue to change throughout the school year. That was my my sort of inarticulate support for Ms. Seeger's um, ad about getting feedback throughout the school year. <laughs> um, how, what are, what are folks feeling about um, voting on this as amended tonight? I'm seeing two thumbs up and very stoic glances from everybody else. I, uh, Ms. Hall. Um, yeah, so I, I'm I'm okay voting uh, on this as amended. I mean, I do, I think uh, to your point earlier, like we have to just make sure we're providing a document that does not 
set the district up for failure that's just impossible to deliver on. And I think this one has enough flexibility in it that that is possible. Um, and I, I mean, I maybe I'm a little pessimistic tonight too, and I don't mean to sound this negative, but like this is so far from the hardest decision that these committees are going to have to make, like the, the bullets in this document. And I just I do think kind of getting, having this, milestone, which is, you know, a step, but not just one step, so that we can really get into these details is the important part. And I don't, again, and not to dismiss how kind of in some ways, like heart wrenching some decisions will be, but I think like, we need to do this, so we can continue to make progress. Because I, I also am just really sensitive to the anxiety collectively in the community around all of this. And to the extent that we can continue to proceed toward clarity, even if it's not perfect clarity, I think that this document at least helps us do that. Mr. Menino? I understand the committee members' reluctance to vote for this document because uh, there may be more students uh, who want to attend than teachers, but I can't see of any way where that's going to change if we amend the uh, document or if we wait three weeks there's it's a basically a fundamental uh, uh, conflict and so to uh, get on with it uh, I propose that uh, I, I would consider uh, voting in favor of the document as amended um, Ms. Kenny and then Ms. Seeker so I guess my question is, um, so I, I understand the adjust the amendment to have, you know, overall goals one, two, three, and four match the overall one, two, three, four goals. Um, but what there was a another bullet point we added. What what is what were the other amendments? I just want to make sure. I'm yes. So the, the <laughs> okay. The, there's uh, three amendments. Um, I think okay. somebody correct me if I don't get these all right. Um, this uh, in the overall goals. Um, so two of them are to match the overall goals of the primary document. So changing the maximizing person learning time um, and removing maintaining six feet physical distance and make uh, substituting in the suite of safety protocols um, and then adding a fourth overall goal. Um, that is, uh, we will remain flexible and adjust our approach as um, as conditions change. The exact wording will be identical to what the the other document. Yeah. And then the third amendment is we are adding in bullet about uh, the district will provide opportunities for staff to provide feedback throughout the school year. Ms. Spitzer. Oh, sorry, um, Ms. Seeger first, <laughs> and then Ms. Spitzer. Uh, I just wanted to say that I feel like um, it's more of a question for Dr. Morris. Like, if us expressing support for this tonight or not, does that slow you down at all in working on this? Um, because I feel like to some degree, you're stuck with this conundrum, whether or not we support this document, um, the conundrum of the different goals. So I'm just wondering how how it would affect you to, to have, give in, in us taking more time to, to think about this. Um, thank you for asking the question. I'm trying to think of a coherent answer. Um, not sure I'll get there, but I'll do my best. Um, I don't, you know, because we had the um, posting era and we had the cancel meeting last week, um, there's, you know, a document that's on our on the website and was emailed to you right before this meeting with an updated agenda that had a timeline for when decisions would be made. Um, so <clears throat> I just think, you know, I don't have a great answer for you, but the longer things get delayed, uh, so I don't want you to all to feel pressure to make a decision tonight. I want to be really super clear about that. Um, I think, you know, I don't think we could put on, I don't think, you know, I don't want to speak for the chair. I don't think you put on tomorrow night necessarily because, you know, I don't think it fits into the less than 48 hours emergency kind of thing, in my personal opinion. 
Um, so you could certainly wait till next week. We could present what we're planning to present tomorrow night because we had one a 24 hour window between tonight and tomorrow night. We had to put together slides and, and a presentation for tomorrow night. We couldn't wait till tonight ended to do a presentation for you all tomorrow. And so it wouldn't have any impact on anything for tomorrow's meeting, but I do wonder, um, there's some different opinions expressed. I'm not gonna weigh in on, on, on those opinions, but it would have a pretty polar change as to what we would do um, in the end. So I do think if it's the committee's not feeling comfortable with tonight, I think that's, I'm totally, I'm absolutely comfortable with, with pushing that. I just think that's gonna then have, you know, trickle down to dominoes. And, and that's, again, that's fine with me. And, and I want the committee to feel comfortable Comfortable is the wrong word. I want them to feel like they've had enough time to discuss and debate issues, um, not because of the administration, but I do think there's some dominoes that are gonna fall and that uh, it might mean sort of multiple meetings or it might mean asking the state to not make a decision by the 10th. And that comes with complications too, because it's not just the state needs that, but it's families that need to count on that as well. So, uh, you know, I'm not, again, I didn't promise coherence and I delivered on my lack of promise, but, um, but at the same time, you know, I want people to feel like they're making decisions that you feel are, are right for you. Um, and administratively, we'll, we'll adjust for that as, as is, you know, not to, I guess I don't, I can talk about it. You know, our phasing plans are really that we presented, we'll present or in the packet anyway, planning to present to right, are very gradual. They involve with very few students in buildings at the beginning of the school year. Yeah. Um, and some of that was because of this. We want to make sure we're planning things accurately and appropriately as we move forward. And we know that time is tight. So uh, forget the last 90 seconds of this meeting because I did nothing to help you answer your question, Ms. Seeger, except that, you know, I want people to feel good about their decisions and to recognize that the longer we go, uh, the matrix of decisions gets smaller. That's not a reason to not to push a, a vote if people aren't, don't feel ready for a vote. Right? It's like anything else. There's consequences to decisions or, or indecisions. Uh, and, you know, but, you know, I don't know. That's where I am on it. Ms. Spitzer, I think I saw your hand up. Sorry. So I, I agree with Mr. Menino that I don't think this is something that needs more time. I, I think this is really something like I don't think in a week I'm going to suddenly feel more comfortable making a decision. Um, I think it's just that I fundamentally have, I, I guess I've been hoping that somebody else would suggest an edit that I could feel comfortable with, but since I, I'm, I'm not sure, <laughs> so I, I'm going to suggest an edit that, that might make me feel more comfortable voting in favor of this, because I have to be honest right now, I, I don't feel comfortable. Um, I'm just trying to bring it up. So um, we could add something to say to the district will seek to accommodate staff who for any reason, you know, go, going through all that. Um, and, you know, this may require changing offerings to students or changes to um, um, staffing and what courses were available. So, um, or you could say we would, we will prioritize in-person learning to the extent possible based on um, staff availability. So I think we could make an edit to this that if other, and I don't know if I'm the only, you know, clearly we're all struggling with this. I'm not sure if, um, but I, I just, I can't, I can't vote for it as it's written right now. So the, the suggestion though that you just, um, the edit that you, as I understood it, would be in direct conflict to the framework that we just voted and approved. Which because we're, we've said that we will offer the student choice, so. But this is the problem with separating them and I, why I, <laughs> so maybe I should have, I can't go back and change my vote, but I mean, we, we made this choice to separate them. I think it's, and, and, and what I led with is that we are now in direct conflict. So I, I <laughs> if I'm the only one who feels this way, this can still move forward and, um, but I, I don't know. Ms. Seeker? I, I really like where you're going with this type of edit, and I'm not convinced that it's totally in direct conflict, meaning that if some of the course offerings maybe don't necessarily need to change, but they need to be done differently, because for at least, you know, with a phase and approach, you can have a lot of students at home at first, so it'd be easier if more staff are at home. Um, and as time goes on, 
when you have, um, I know K through six could be kind of tricky once a lot of those students are back in school, but at least in the middle school and high school where you have the virtual days, um, there might be some synergy there for, uh, maybe it will work out is what I'm saying. Um, it may not, it, you know, it's it's hard. You have to throw a bunch of things in the air and, and see where they land, but, um, or even, so if you have kids in a classroom who all face forward and listen to one teacher who's in the front of a classroom, um, I'm completely brainstorming here and not advocating for this, but to have a teacher, um, well, this is, this is hard at the elementary level, but if you had a teacher on Zoom or Google Hangouts who shows up on, in the front of the classroom to teach that one subject, um, you know, how that, that type of thing is possible. Um, it maybe not so much pre-K through six, that, that could be a little bit tricky and I wouldn't advocate for that all day. I'm saying like if there was a period during the day of, you know, 30 to 60 minutes where someone is brought in that way. Um, so, you know, there's definitely a conflict, but it might not be 100, a 100% conflict. It, 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 this problem just gets more and more challenging. Yeah, I, I feel yeah. like it, it becomes a slippery slope though, in terms of defining, getting into the weeds of matching licenses, um, you know, current current roles. So, uh, in, in all of that, and how do we define, how do we state something so that's broadly, that's broad enough to encompass, you know, all potential permutations, um, but while still addressing that, and I, I, if you if you have um, if if we've said that we're prioritizing having special ed students um, and ELL students and in person learning, particularly in the in phase one, some of the the, the specialized programs, um, and let's say we have I don't know uh, you know uh, ten students that are that fall into that group. Um, or 20, and but we don't have enough teachers who are equipped to to work with those students that are willing to serve in person. We we can't sort of say we, we can't at that point say okay you can work remotely because somebody still has to be in the room with them. Right. So if if we're saying that we're prioritizing those students, we have to be able to staff those students and, and support those students in the way that we've described that we want to support them. Um, and that's where I, I, I just keep coming back to, I, I just don't know how we meet sort of our desire to provide flexibility and choice for students for, um, and, and meet our desires of prioritizing those, those special populations in our schools. And at the same time say that staff have 100% flexibility to make their own decision on how they want to work. I, 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 I hate saying that out loud. I hate, like, that is just super, super uncomfortable. But I, I don't know how we, how we say the opposite, which is yeah. that we're going to tell a family with special needs students that they have to stay at home and sorry, we can't help them because we don't have the staff to do that. Right? So uh, these are the hard, hard choices that we are going to have to, make as a as, as a district in this committee um mr menino your reticence is understandable the student needs must take priority for a school uh we seek to accommodate all the needs of teachers we may not be able to satisfy every teacher's needs but the students needs are paramount Um, um, Ms. Kenny and then Ms. Spitzer. So I, I don't know if this is actually helpful, but this is like, you know, in my other life, not school committee life, we had to make similar decisions because it, so schools are not the only ones that have had to make these really unfortunate, tough, terrible feeling decisions about being able to honor your employee's request with the 
job that needs to get done, right? So I, it feels really yucky, but I, I don't know how it can have it be too much different. But where at the same time, like I have the same feelings, like asking someone to go into a classroom that they're uncomfortable about feels super yucky to me. Um, but you know, it's, it's not a unique problem, I guess. Ms. Spitzer? I mean, so I work in a healthcare setting and I know that a lot of, there are so many healthcare workers who have done just, you know, what we're asking our teachers to do, which is go in and potentially expose themselves to, to a disease that we know is, is very dangerous. And so I guess uh, I'm wondering if we could, you know, at least because we're saying, you know, we're, this is guidance. And I think one of the guidance is, well, if, if we could provide guidance that this, you know, that we may consider making changes, you brought up probably the hardest choice we could make with a special ed student, but there may be choices where it's a high school English teacher who is asking for the special accommodation. And, and maybe then that high school English class is delivered remotely. And honestly, that doesn't bother me on the same scale as it would telling a special education student. So if we could just acknowledge that sometimes meeting these preferences of the teachers might be mean not offering every single course, you know, in person that we would like to. And, and we're gonna have to rank these, but to, to just put in there that this may require us to change our course offerings in a way that, you know, so it might not be what students and families would want, but that we're making it because we value our teachers and, and, and that we're willing to make that sacrifice in our in our in-person education offerings if it means providing um, a work, you know, our workforce the support that they feel like they need. I just I, I know that um, I, I I guess the thing I'm really worried about is just that this turning into a situation where people feel like we're not going to take their non-medical preferences seriously and then they will seek i mean i can't think of a person who probably couldn't come up with some way that they might be able to argue that they require a medical um waiver so i, I i'm feeling like if, if we're gonna have this like opener thing it, it could get okay i see my it might just be dr morris um i also doc, uh, mr menino had his hand raised i, I do um Mr. Mignon, are you okay if we let Dr. Morris respond first? Dr. Morris has my full, he, he can talk. <laughs> Again, I'm just gonna, my, our experience so far has been that staff have been remarkably candid with us about um, if there are medical needs, they've been remarkably candid with us. And, and I do feel like I, I, our staff are wonderful and I think they're, um, I'm not worried about, you know, and I'm not using, I don't know exactly how you put it, Ms. Spitzer, but just, you know, kind of um, flexing the system so much, you know, um, that's, uh, you know, uh, I don't share that concerns based on the data we have and, you know, my experience with staff um, that people would produce medical notes, um, you know, inaccurately or something, you know, um, sort of enhancing conditions, I, you know, I think our staff are honest and, and I'm not suggesting that all want to come back. Like that's not where I'm coming from, but on that particular point, uh, I don't have evidence right now that that has happened. Um, you know, our experience with human resource offices have been remarkably honest and candid um, about that. And I wouldn't expect that to change from our staff. Mr. Menino? Well, I would like to vote affirmatively for this uh, uh, a document this evening. If it would make sense for Ms. Spitzer to have time, postpone the vote until she could come up with a friendly amendment that would make sense. I can't imagine what that amendment would be, but I'd be willing to postpone the vote. Um, Ms. Spitzer, you're shaking your head. I don't think there's a need to postpone. Um, Ms. Lord. I also wanted to mention that um, we can prioritize our students' needs, absolutely. And I believe still prioritize our staff's needs. I think there's a, a gray area of people who would send their kid back but could also do remote learning. So if for some reason there weren't enough teachers, we could, you know, like sort of like Ms. Spitzer said, I think there will be some wiggle room to prioritize 
Um, I would, you know, just, I wanted to say that it's not like necessarily the worst case scenario. And, and I, I do feel that by having in there that we will seek to accommodate staff and maybe it's, um, uh, maybe we can add as much as possible um, who for any reason. So if that sort of gets at this idea that they're, that it's not just accommodating them, that it's also looking at other ways to be creative in accommodating them, um, those preferences. Um, and, and I think also, to, you know, we've we've stated several times that our over, one of you know our number one overall goal is to protect staff and student safety, and we've listed in that other document all the steps that we're taking and and for our um, uh, our, our protocols and. Not that that's going to make everybody feel 100% comfortable. We're still all going to feel really uncomfortable, but the same is true for students and families as well. Um, and we're not asking, um, we're not creating um, separate safety scenarios or, or safety protocols for students versus staff at this point. So, um, uh, uh, Dr. Morris, did you have your hand raised? No. Um, would would adding that that phrase um, in in that second bullet will seek to accommodate staff if we said as much as possible who for any reason um, and continue to does that I'm seeing a head shake as in no don't do that um, Ms. Hall. I mean, I, I don't mind it. it. It does seem a bit redundant. We're already saying we'll seek to. Yeah. So I, I'm not strongly opposed, but okay. I think we can do with that. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm also hearing that um, an, more time is not going to change things. So. Um, I, I do feel like maybe we, we should move um, if somebody would make a motion um, at, at this point so that uh, if, if time is not going to help us on this one, um, then let's. I move that uh, we adopt the uh, motion for Amherst Pelham. Um, uh, planning and support staff as uh, written with the uh, as written with the uh, amendments to the goals. I'm going to take that as a motion for the region committee. Is there a second? I will second that. Um, is there any further discussion? Uh, just that the amended the motion with amended is more than just the goals yes actually the added bullet so as amended okay so we'll move to a roll call vote um ms lord lord nay mr menino menino i ms seeger seeger i Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, nay. Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Ms. Spitzer, for bringing this out. But uh, Sullivan, I. And McDonald, I. Um, the motion uh, passes. Um, four to two with one, two, uh, three not present. Since uh, I am not going to take a motion for the Amherst Committee um, at this point. Okay, uh, I'll take a motion for the Pelham Committee. Am I the only one? <laughs> uh, um, move to adapt the uh, 
framework for planning and support uh, for staff as amended. Is there a second? We're sure. I'll second. I will second. Any further discussion? Okay, I'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Menino. Menino, I. Ms. Kenny. Uh, Kenny, I. And Hall, I. Oh, so sorry. So that's uh, three in favor and uh, one not present for Pelham. Um, I've, I'm, I'm going to just look for to Dr. Morris for just a piece of advice on the Amherst committee. Um, does it, it, it's unlikely to pass in the Amherst committee. So do we take a, take a vote and, and have it not pass or do we just not move on? Um, I, Is my advice would be take a vote. Um, and if it doesn't pass, it doesn't pass. And we get to upcoming agenda topics. I'll have more to share on, on that piece, but Sounds good. we have a quorum here. We should, you know, my, my advice would be to vote. Okay. I, I just don't know procedural um, parliamentary procedures, so that's why I was asking. Um, uh, okay, so I will um, move to uh, accept the uh, framework for planning support for staff uh, document as amended. Is there a second? Lord, second. Uh, moved by McDonald's, second by uh, Lord. Um, and we will take a roll call vote. Ms. Lord. Nay. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, nay. And McDonald, aye. The motion fails. One, two, two, and two not present. And now I will text our colleagues or chat them to come back in. Can I ask a question of just about, I guess, somewhat related to procedure, but um, could this come up again if people want to amend it? Like, can this be, um, well, no, I imagine we're sending people in a direction um, and I was just thinking out loud if something like this, if people did have more thoughts. We are moving on to future meeting planning. <laughs> so, um, uh, absolutely. Uh, any any committee member may um, request an agenda item and make a motion in the future. Great. Um, so, future meeting planning. I think we have the this uh, the the detailed schedule is in tomorrow night's agenda packet. Is that correct, Dr. Morris? Sorry, uh, I'm not sure. Um, so I got to, this is all happening live, right? Obviously, I got to think through whether it makes sense for the Amherst School Committee to meet tomorrow night, given um, that I don't think it makes sense to present. Um, I'm not sure administratively, and, and this isn't a critique of the vote or any of the votes taken. I just, I'm not sure what makes sense for the Amherst school committee, um, I think they probably need to have a different conversation uh, than the one that's gonna take place for Pelham and the region um, tomorrow night. Um, again, there is, I'm just being explicit because I, I think I wanna be careful with my language, but there, I'm not sure it makes sense to go forward in planning um, because I'm not sure what to do with staff. And if I don't know what to do with staff, I don't know how to present a plan. Yeah. So I wonder if there needs to be a separate meeting for the Amherst Public Schools on next steps uh, that this happens distinctly from the region and from Pelham. I know that saves no one a meeting tomorrow night um, because everyone on Amherst is on the region. So there's no reason to celebrate that for anyone who was hoping to do something fun on a Tuesday night. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I just, uh, I, I'm not sure. I need to process a little bit of next steps, but I think presenting, um, a detailed phasing plan for the Amherst Public Schools. I'm not sure how to do that. Yeah. To be very transparent. Um, we do, I will say that the Amherst School Committee is meeting on Tuesday the 28th um, as, as a single committee meeting. Um, 
for another purpose. So that um, that absolutely absolutely could be added to uh, that one. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm open to committee members' thoughts, but and, and again, I'm not trying to be difficult. But I, I think uh, I, what I don't want to do is present information that um, that I don't have a way to understand how to implement. And that's right. a little how I'm feeling at the moment. And so that's not a critique. It's just probably a separate conversation that the Amherst School Committee uh, and staff need to have on next steps. Um, yeah. um, for the folks that were had recused themselves from the discussion, then the um, staff section uh, was voted in Pelham and the region. Um, well, it was voted in all three, but it, and it passed in Pelham and the region. It did not pass in Amherst. Hence the, the discussion about um, separating out the Amherst uh, Elementary School plan. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. I'm open to divergent thoughts on that, you know, and it's not hard to cancel the meeting in Amherst. Uh, we can just put up canceled. We can leave it posted in terms of Pelham and region. Uh, but I think the conversations will be different. Ms. Spitzer? I, I think this is the tricky thing for me, is that we've been having all of these meetings jointly representing all the phasing as, as though it's all, but if it's really separate, you know, and the union for our organization, correct me if I'm wrong, but is the union for our organization for all three districts as well, for the all, teachers? All, yeah, I would say all of our unions. I want to be just remind that there's multiple yeah. bargaining units, not just the, the APEA, which covers teachers, paras, and, and clerical, but there's other bargaining units as well. So here's the thing that's been really hard for me, is that all of the we're getting all of the comment as though it's all coming as one. We're getting all of the, you know, and, and it could be that, and, and and I guess one of the things I want to understand is, is this staffing planning that you're going to do, is there the ability, I mean, we're talking about shifting staff among buildings, you know, have, and I know this has changed, the thinking of this has changed, but the reason we originally were meeting all together was because we're talking about bringing students into one of the regional buildings from the Amherst Public Schools. And and I guess in my thinking of this, I have been thinking of it somewhat fluidly. And maybe that's a problem. <laughs> maybe we've now created a situation where we're now, um, but is that how much fluidity is there? So if, if uh, would we ever take a high school teacher and deploy them in an elementary school or vice versa if there was a need? Or is this getting into a, a off? To, I may be getting us off of the topic, but yeah, I don't think you are actually, because I think this this relates to future meeting planning. In my personal opinion, obviously, that's the, the yeah. most chairs get to weigh, they get to rule on that. But for me, it it feels comfortable. So I think the challenge on that one is that it's different districts and different payrolls and different employers technically. So um, if there was some inter district agreement on that, I think a couple of things for me would need to happen is the the people in Leverett and Shutesbury in particular would need to communicate to their select board and finance committees that because it's hard to, I think there's a very compelling counter narrative to that being okay, uh, particularly in communities that don't have an elementary school that is, that I work for um, and it's their money. Um, so. I think our governance structure, uh, as, and I think that's what you're noting, does create some challenges with districts that, for instance, and you've seen some examples probably online, have prioritized elementary education as being in person and 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 per secondary education to not be in person. And I think there's some compelling reasons for that. Um, that's a conversation that's out of my uh, ability to answer because it's not it's not about me. It's about the taxpayers and how they value things. Um, and I, so I can't weigh in on that particular question from a licensure perspective. Uh, we are, you know, the state has allowed for emergency licensure. Um, and so there is some flexibility, but I think thinking about uh, if I was a high school teacher teaching first grade, some people could certainly do that, but it's a pretty polar shift that you might be asking people um, to do. So I think that there's, you know, the licensure pieces is the easiest part to work out. The funding in multiple districts uh, would be hard, and also what what kind of professional development would we provide for staff? So, um, you know, that's a conversation I'm open to philosophically. I think logistically, it would take uh, a lot of people around the room to do a lot of work to pull that off.
any. Right. Sorry if that wasn't, I don't know if that was helpful or not, but <laughs> I don't know if the silence was uh, showed it wasn't helpful, but. Well, we don't have to decide, um, oh, Mr. Demling. I mean, I would just say if the superintendent is expressing such ambivalence towards presenting a model tomorrow, given given the, the lack of clarity on, at the Amherst level, then it doesn't make sense to present a detailed model at the Amherst level. Because because then we're setting people up to say, well, if a decision is made that hasn't yet been made, this is what it will look like. And and it's and then and then potentially changing everything the next time. I think I think if we're gonna talk through the implications of what our staffing resources how that affects our model, then that needs to be a, a focused discussion. I, I do agree. And I, I think it's, um, if, if it's quote unquote it, easy to cancel the Amherst School Committee meeting tomorrow night, and we know we have one on the calendar already, so it's it, we don't have to, um, so I, I can't remember, Dr. Morris, if you were available for that one, so I, I think, um, Originally, I wasn't, but I'll make myself available. Mm -hmm. yep. um, okay. So we will continue as planned for tomorrow evening for region and Pelham conversation. Um, and then um, the further calendar, um, we will again talk about um, tomorrow night with a lot more um, details of. Um, of sort of next steps and milestones planning um, for uh, getting us back to school. Um, so as mentioned, we have the, the region um, meeting tomorrow evening, the Amherst um, School Committee on the 28th, and we are tentatively looking at another um, joint meeting um, later next week as well. But we'll get to that tomorrow. Any other thoughts on future meeting planning at this point? No, okay. There's a hand up, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, <laughs> uh, Mr. Harrington. So not, I, I guess this is kind of more vague to future meetings in general, but um, I, I just wanna kind of offer the idea that we might maybe consider talking about meeting in person at some point before we open schools. It, it, that seems to be a shared sentiment of, um, among a lot of people I talk to. But it's my little two cents. Uh, Mr. Demling, is is it allowed by the town of Amherst, the town manager, to need no that that recently? Okay. He. Yeah, yeah. He he. I I did get in touch with him because um, some community members have gotten in touch with me. I've had meetings, people in the same space. Um, I'm not judging comfort of any uh, committee members, but it was clear, it was made clear that at least for the, in the town of Amherst, that that is not currently allowed. I think it also just raises one other piece that I hadn't thought of that I did hear from another elected official, not in this group, is for people um, who may have um, autoimmune or other health challenge, uh, it creates, you know, they can't be counted on for quorum based on remote rooting rules. So there's some things I hadn't thought of that actually in another community, not in this one, I heard about that made me think about that um, a little differently. So, but at this point, it, it, my understanding from the town manager is a moot point. But I appreciate you raising it because I've heard it too, Mr. Harrington. Yes, and we were, we've, we've been, uh, I've been talking about it with, uh, the chairs and vice chairs as well about how how we could look at doing that potentially and there's um, so many things for us to consider um, in before our our buildings are open but as a public meeting there's different requirements um, on us than um, than just a meeting <laughs> um, so it's complex <laughs> just like anything we're dealing with in in this pandemic. Unless, um, uh, Ms. Spitzer. Just thinking about the implications of us canceling the Amherst meeting tomorrow, and I understand the reason, but it's, if we originally were holding all three of them together because the topics spanned grades, so like the potential of having kids in the middle school, et cetera, if that is now, is it true? Like if what you're presenting tomorrow is not in any way going to impact the Amherst schools, then maybe we don't hold it. But if we, if we don't call the meeting tomorrow, will we then be, 
unable to talk about anything that impacts the elementary level, in which case, would it make sense to just call the meeting, but maybe not present the plan for, I, like, I get what you're saying, Dr. Morris, about like, now we've, we've kind of thrown a wrench in the gears in terms of your planning, but I'm worried if we cancel it, then we're just going to be totally unable to talk about in implications of the region, regional plan on, on the elementary school kids. I, without asking you to answer, I think we, we do that by only speaking about the regional plan. Um, and the regional models, and we don't talk about the Amherst elementary models. And the elementary model is is only Pelham at this point. I mean, I think uh, I hear your point, Ms. Spitzer. I don't disagree with Ms. McDonald. I think if the committee wants to call the meeting to order, it hasn't been canceled yet, um, so that's that's fine. Um, I guess my only thing I would say is, you know, I would just pull out all the information as it relates to the Amherst Elementary Schools. Um, and I wouldn't be speaking about it, but I think, Ms. Spitzer, I think if, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're referring to Crocker Farm and there was, again, because it was all publicly online because it was posted, we tried to share with the community that there was some different elementary models about, you know, hybrid models that would keep all students at Crocker Farm, Crocker Farm students, you know, fifth and sixth grade at Crocker Farm. But I think that's what you're referring to. But if I'm missing something, if I'm wrong, please let me know. Uh, no, that's what I'm saying. It just seemed like we were calling these meetings, well, three districts together because we felt like there were topics that would come up and it would be freeing to be able to talk about all of the districts that we represent or work for at the same time, if if needed. Um, yeah, I mean, I think since the committees are all here for future planning, I think there's very low impact on the middle school for anything that happens at Crocker Farm in terms of space. There's no additional maps for the middle school. Um, I think I'd be able to talk about that pretty clear, pretty cleanly without delving into an Amherst Elementary topic. It's really a, it was really an Amherst Elementary topic and with relatively light impact on the region. Um, so, um, I mean, I'm happy going either way, but I feel like it won't constrain my presentation. Um, to not talk about that topic. Whether constraints your dialogue is is certainly what I'm most interested in hearing, but for me, it would not be a constraint not to have Amherst posted. Okay. Um, are we um, able to move on to the next item now? Okay. Um, one, um, I think um, I, I'm going to look to and ask Ms. Spitzer if she has any warrants for um, for the region um, while I pull up the warrants for Amherst. <laughs> do you, I do have regional warrants, but I will also need to pull up because I've been a little. <laughs> I, I have one already to go, so I will read. Um, sorry, then. Um, so for Amherst, I, Alison McDonald, authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $141,911.67 for the warrant dated June 20th, 2020. This includes general fund expenses of $107,602.74, revolving fund expenses of $1,693.88, and grant fund expense of $17,652.70. A gift for the school of $2,029.80 and capital of $12,932.55. And I signed that on July 16th. I also um, Authorized by my signature, payables in the amount of $83,559.66 for a warrant dated June 16th, 2020. This includes general fund expenses of $49,839.70, revolving fund expenses of $1,491.64, grant fund expenses of $22,228.32, and capital of $10,000. And I signed that on July 10th. Um, I believe this is a duplicate. Yeah, that is. 
is, sorry. Um, I'm going to have to pass on the others because I can't find, um, there were some payrolls um, pages that I signed as well, but they're not showing up in this folder. So, um, Ms. Spitzer. Sure. Um, so I authorized for my signature to payables in the amount of $51,323 for the warrant dated June 23rd, 2020. And this was signed on July 15th, 2020. Oh. And I should clarify, it was for revolving fund expenses. I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $105,881.35 for the warrant dated July 8th, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $1,005. $1,005. This includes general fund expenses of $105,881.35. This was signed on July 16th, 2020. And that is all I have to report. I'm just double checking one more time that I might have figured out which one is the right one. No. It's not there. Hmm. Okay, um, we'll tackle those in another day. Um, so uh, next on our agenda is gifts, and I do we have? I don't believe we have any gifts tonight. No. Okay. Uh, so uh, would the Amherst School Committee like to make a motion, Mr. Demling? I move to adjourn the Emerson School Committee. Second. Moved by Demling, second by Switzer. Roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. And Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, we are, the Amherst School Committee is adjourned. Ms. Hall? All right, thanks. Is there a motion to adjourn from the Pelham School Committee? I move we adjourn the Pelham School Committee. All right. I second. second. Oh, thank you. All right, great. I'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Dancer? Dancer, aye. Ms. Kenny? Kenny, aye. And Hall, aye. Pelham is adjourned. Would somebody like to make a motion for the region? I move to adjourn the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee. Lord second. By Demling, second and by Lord. There's no discussion. Roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Um, region committee is adjourned. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Amherst Media. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>